Hi everyone, so welcome on Italian Military Archives. This is actually the first live show we are doing on this channel in English. And uh, for this uh, very first uh, special live show, I have uh, a very renowned guest, which I will bring in, him to the screen immediately, which is Dr. Dr. Alexander Clark from Kingston University. Hi, Alex. How are you doing? Hello. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Always a pleasure to be here. Although you and I were chatting last night as well. So now you and I yeah. are... are are chatting a lot at the moment which is good yeah 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 i'm very happy about that because you know the one of the first thing i had in mind when i uh, started to talk about uh, italian history on first uh, instagram then twitter and later youtube uh i always have had in mind the idea to keep my contents in both in english and in italian because i think what is lacking uh not in the academic world because i know there there are some developments going on there in the let's say general public world there there's much more need to the different perspective to to talk and interact oh, and so this you, uh, you can cause full panic attacks by going i'm i'm using italian sources as well as the English sources. And you can also <laughs> do that with the Japanese sources, although I have a problem sometimes because sometimes people tell me there are these sources in the Japanese and I go, that's lovely. Can you show them to me? And they go, well, no, I've only heard about them. And I go, well, I can't use them and can't change what I've written because I haven't seen the sources. Because yeah. <laughs> in academic writing, as we all know, the rule is you have to be able to prove what you're saying. And True. you have to be able to back it up. As long as you can back it up, you're fine. But you can't, but you, it's not a case of you can't go, well, my mate down the pub told me there's this source which says this and put that in a document. You can't do that. You have to very much, you have to see it yourself and you have to be able to go, yeah, no. It, 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 I, I've seen it. I know what it says. And there it is. And yeah, what's good with the, with the Italian sources, I have to admit, is speaking as someone who learned Latin till quite a late, a, a lot longer than he learned it, basically Italian. Uh, there are a lot of people now who are doing the translation for me, which is far more reliable than Google Translate doing it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> far more reliable. <laughs> I, I, I do occasionally on my channel play out for people because I think they'd enjoy it, the Google Translate, what the Google Translate is saying. And just um, the, the responses usually from people is going, don't please don't use that don't use that at all <laughs> yeah good so great that we we are having this chat because it's uh, especially for the mediterranean theater uh, i mean the the italian sources uh, let's say the um, the sources that i've from which i learned the most were never translated to to english they were written in the between the 70s the 80s uh, some of the later works of the 90s were uh, translated some of the technical uh, uh, books on the on the class of ships and battleships were translated uh, uh, but i think there's still a lot of work to be done and we are here to to try with, with the the whole humbleness of the world to 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 start filling this gap slowly but also you also always have the problem and this is going to come with a lot with this uh, this particular discussion is that other events happen which are similar to it. So therefore, the same motives and aims and methodologies are ascribed to it as what went into those. And it's actually a case of it's like trees. There are all these things categorized together as trees. But actually, when you look at them on a genetic level and a familial level, there are they, some trees are different, so different from other types of trees. They might well be, uh, they're, they're an entire different genus, species, completely yeah. different. They're, they're, they might look both look like trees, but they're so different from each other in reality that they are completely different things. And of course, the one that comes up is always Pearl Harbor. But yeah, at Pearl Harbor, we'll get to that you point. Have, yeah, in, uh, as a case, as a Pearl Harbor, you have the full effort of the Japanese. That's an attack, Taranto, as you've carefully put it, and quite rightly have put it as a it's a raid. And there is a difference between what is a raid and what is an attack. 
Yeah, we go through uh, this in the, in the second part. So uh, to give you an idea of the, what we will be covering. So we'll go through three main blocks. So we will cover the prelude. So what happened uh, between June and November 1940. So the first phase of the Mediterranean War. Then we will go into the, um, the attack operation judgment, which was part of a larger operation, which will... Uh, touch upon but we will mainly focus on operation judgment and now we will assess the the battle damages uh, what were the consequences of Taranto on a strategic and tactical level and the aftermath of the of the um, of the attack and we will also have uh, a bonus uh, uh, a slide provided by Alex that we will uh, <laughs> cover at the end so uh, that's the really have... that slide is really to help explain the difference between a raid and an attack <laughs> an and attack. what an attack would look like yeah, exactly. So June, the period June November 1940. So Italy enters the war. Uh, Italy enters the war at the point where France was already collapsing, and uh, they don't have to really um, be concerned about the combined might of the Mediterranean fleet and the Marine Nationale. So let's be honest, they enter the war at the point at which they think they're going to win and it's going to be a quick victory and therefore exactly. they don't want to not be part of the war and not be part of the spoils. <laughs> exactly, because this exactly. is fat boy, fun boy. And sorry to the Italian viewers who may not have heard that expression before, but there are two <laughs> people who get that expression in history. One of them is Henry VIII, because he is the original fat boy, fun boy. And um, the other one is Il Duce, Mussolini. <laughs> Because, let's be honest, he's also a fat boy, fun boy. So, you know, yeah. it, it basically ascribes a leader who is often more interested in how things look and what the fun is it Absolutely. than the reality and actual detail of it. Yeah. And this is something I always want to underline that um, different from Hitler. I mean, we know that Hitler had uh, some military understanding of also on the technology technological side you know he was always thinking about which uh, gun putting on which uh, tank chassis and so on M Mussolini had he literally no understanding whatsoever understanding. yeah yeah but yeah. certainly more than Mussolini so Mussolini was well, absolutely uh, ignorant uh, on that, the that's matters. setting the bar very low you're basically saying because you can clear a bar down here you have understanding but of the the leaders of the world in terms of military understanding, at the time we're talking about, I'm not sure I would rate any of them particularly highly. It's no, kind of, no, not absolutely. It's not so much. It's it's how many phones are you clearing in your in your footstep? If I put my phone up, yeah, it's basically can you clear one phone in a walk or two? <laughs> it's not can you clear a hurdle? Yeah. Anyway, so Italy enters the war with the wishful, some wishful thinking and hoping that uh, the war will be over soon. But uh, it, also, I want to point out that uh, in the prospect of a war with uh, France and um, the UK, the Regia Marina uh, assessed that it was not possible to resupply Libya. So Libya was meant to endure alone. Maybe the, there was the chance to mount a uh, resupply mission before the start of the hostilities. And that's it. Libya would have had to endure alone. The thing is, with the collapse of France, this prospect changes. And uh, actually, the very first uh, major resupply operation is organized in July 1940. And basically, the entire Italian surface fleet uh, goes at sea escorting this convoy, which was not very large. I think there were like six six merchants in total. There's almost, and, I think, a ratio of almost... I think it's the, the inverse of the ratio of the British transatlantic convoys in that it has about six warships for every single merchant ship or, or something like that. It's the sort of ratio which, if the Royal Navy had been able to provide for Battle Atlantic, they yeah. would have been ecstatic. Yeah, and uh, the thing is that at this point in time, you know, the, the Regio Marina has consistent uh, fuel supplies at this point, but they know that they are uh, worthy for one one year, one year and a half of operations uh, at the most. But in this, uh, especially in 1940, there are no 
no clear restrictions on the use of naft and so you see often the the entire battle fleet uh, going out at sea even if they do not uh, engage or in, in this case they will engage because the the result of this operation later will be the the, the battle of Cla calabria which will not touch in detail because otherwise it will take us uh, an entire life to do well, so. To be fair, if you and I did all of these and Taranto, <laughs> we probably would be still talking here tomorrow at this tomorrow, time. Tomorrow, so yeah. If people, if people would like a 24 hour live, I'm up for it, but I just need to get another bottle of Iron Brew. Yeah. So to put things shortly, the, there's the Battle of Calabria, then in. Uh, some weeks later in July, there's the brief clash of Cape Spada where two uh, Jusano class cruisers are uh, caught by a formation of British destroyers and uh, light cruiser Sydney. And in that to, to put it shortly, uh, in that occasion, the Jusano class cruisers uh, show up their uh, the flow design and their uh, armor issues. It's a, and for that, I recommend uh, Alex's video on the on, on the Giussano class that was published Thank you. a couple of weeks ago, right? Apologies for the bad Italian in there. Yeah, I no. was, as said, I was using, uh, I was doing it quickly and using Google Translate to try and teach me the Italian phraseology. Now, I, 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 and I didn't do what I do now, which is I have the Google Translate do it to Italian, so you can all hear what I'm trying to make sure I'm pronouncing the name right because. Yeah. I, I can't. It, don't take this the wrong way, but I can't call up Giulio at Giulio at you know eleven o'clock at night UK time and go. Could you please help me through this phrase? Because it'd be a bit rude on my part. So I use Google, and it has interesting results. We'll leave Good. it aside. Yeah. So then uh, there's the uh, the clash of Cape Passero later uh, in October. It's a, a clash between uh, Italian destroyers and uh, formation of cruises and uh, British destroyers, which ends up bad for the Italians. But overall, the first months of war in the Mediterranean are, let's say, inconclusive because the main uh, tasks, the main missions of the, the two opponents, the Regia Marine and the, uh, and the Royal Navy, are... The, the, their tasks are carried out. So the Italians have the main objective to resupply Libya, and they do that almost unopposed. The British, at the same time, have the, sub, the task to resupply Malta, and they also go mainly unopposed. Only uh, there will be some occasions where they are at sea, they mount this very complex operation, as it will be in the case of uh, Operation MB8. Uh, the Italians try to counter these operations with some submarines, with uh, air, um, aircraft. Uh, they start to witness that their air power is not well suited for this kind of war because the Regia Aeronauti had never truly trained for war over the Mediterranean. They have trained for another kind of war. And uh, yeah, the, the battle fleet goes out at sea even after uh, the Battle of Calabria, even when the, the two Littorio class battleships are operational. But uh, at this point, there are there is some on 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 one side there are there is a problem with a reconnaissance, which is sometimes faulty. It it does not serve well the Regia Marina. On the other side, there is a, a, a cautious approach by Supermarina, the Navy High Command. At this point, personified by Admiral Cavagnari, who is uh, chief of staff of the Navy and also under secretary under secretary for the Navy, uh, who was in very he was stressing a lot the idea of the fleet in being, but maybe he was pushing it to the extreme. Uh, he was. Should I mean, we also to... mention the fact of who the secretary of the Navy was at this time, technically, because it was technically a Duce. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think I, I, I would like to sort of because this is it's no, the, the, when the, he was minister. He was minister, yeah, minister and the minister, minister, minister and the secretary. Yeah, yeah. then there's some but um it's what I would like to say, and this is the point where it's probably easier for me to say it because I won't look like I'm defending my nation. But coordinating between an air force and a navy in terms of actual spotting is incredibly difficult. Yeah. If we go back to the UK, it was considered so difficult, even at the formation of the Royal Air Force in 1918, where the fleet, where the Royal Naval Air Service and, Air, and, the, and the Royal Flying Corps were combined to form the RAF. 
even at that point, it was made the decision that the observers, the people who would sit in the back seat of Royal Navy Air, of the Fleet Air and Aircraft, which we owned and flown by the Royal Air Force, would be Royal Navy because mm. they would have a far better chance of identifying and understanding other ships than Air Force people who could be trained up to it. It was far better for someone who was Navy and far easier for them to be trained up because they already lived and understood the ships. The Italian, the Rager Aeronautica, do not have that. So they are trying the most difficult way of observation and most importantly of identification in that they have people who are trained up for it from an Air Force background rather than a naval background. And that's even before war begins, when pretty much everyone ends up doing that. But prior to war, that you know, when you're trying to build up the knowledge and the skills, that's how the Royal Navy, how the British had managed to push it with a fleet air arm. Mm -hmm. But this is an important thing to remember. When you're passing on information, we often talk about the information that's being passed on and whether or not there's a fight over the, the information being passed. But the quality matters because if things are misidentified, it can make you, the more often that happens, the less trust you then have in the information. So even if the information is passed on, you don't know whether to trust it or not. Mm -hmm. And this is a big thing for the Italians going through out the entirety of the war. There is not just the quantity of information, but also the veracity of information. It's constantly something which some admirals and some officers are questioning, not because the actual aeronautica doesn't improve as war goes on. They do. But because of this early period when they're still learning and they're learning under the most adverse circumstances because they're people, they don't have the, how do I put it, the background in naval affairs to see, to understand ships. They're from an air background, mm -hmm. which is very good for what they're doing, but not very good for identifying the ships, which is past their role. And for the reconnaissance, one of the most important things if you're doing maritime reconnaissance. Yeah. And... To add on this, they were never conducting joint uh, um, joint training so between the Air Force and the and the Regio Marina. So also coupled with the general lack of training of the both armed forces, also because of uh, availability of funds, uh, fuel, and so on, uh, it was not easy to carry out the training and especially joint training between between the two armed forces. Mm. So. Uh, this is in a nutshell the 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 context of june for of the summer and fall 1940 uh and here i would like to thank uh, tucci and world of worship who right one hour ago they provided me with this uh, map that they prepared for their uh, sh live show on taranto from 2020 and uh, thanks to Uchi again for, for this. So you can see uh, the geographical location of the main uh, clashes that we mentioned and also those that happened after Taranto that we will touch upon in the <laughs> last part. So uh, this is something I really wanted to underline. That's uh, the fact that during summer 1940, there are interesting things happening, uh, which are kind of a, a, pre a, a prelude to Taranto because what happens is that the fleet terror attacks uh, with his uh, torpedo bombers, the swordfish torpedo bombers. Uh, it attacks the Libyan ports, Beng namely Be Benghazi and Tobruk, and they manage to sink in harbor uh, a series of destroyers. Here's the, the Nembo sunk in Benghazi. Then we have the Zephyro sunk in Tobruk. And we also have the Borea sunk in Benghazi. So these are the early examples of uh, torpedo bombers attacking the um, surface ships at anchor in, in ports. Not very well defended, to, to be honest, but uh, ports with shallow waters. And so these were alarm bells that could have... Uh, told something to the Italians. But yes, but you can find a lot of reasons for why the swordfish. And you have to remember, I, I will point this out from the beginning. So this is yeah, go a on. fluffy torpedo, which I'm going to use. Right. So as we all know, the, both the British and the Japanese developed the idea of adding wooden wooden extended fins onto torpedoes to help them, die, help them when they're dropped from aircraft to try and keep them shallow. So they drop yeah. shallow. Quite a lot of other services around the world experiment the same idea. 
but they still find them going too deep for these shallow harbors most of the time. But occasionally they do sort of do bob up and are OK. So it's basically it's considered as a freak. How and by the Italians, by most people. What most people don't realize is the British have gone a step further because the British are clinically insane. They have developed <laughs> something which works with the swordfish. And it works with the swordfish and only with the swordfish because the swordfish is a biplane and it goes at the speed it goes. And that is they've attached the tension wire with a little reel to the aircraft. So the torpedo actually doesn't detach from the aircraft like you'd imagine because it detaches, but it still retains this cable. And sometimes I stick cotton in this one. I'm showing this off all the way down. You imagine a sort of a, a reel the whole mm -hmm. way down to give tension. Now. Why, you might ask, does no one pick up on this? Because cables in the water after a ship's been damaged are not something anyone's really going to consider. There's lots of reasons cables could be in the water, so no one notices these tension wires. Without these tension wires, the Royal Navy would never have managed to make its torpedoes belly flop. Instead, they would do, like everyone else, variations on a dive and go down. It's thanks to the torpedo, the, the, the tension wires that the torpedoes belly flop and run as shallow as they do. Without that, the Royal Navy wouldn't have been able to do these things. So if the Royal Navy had had some of their later faster aircraft, which couldn't really work with the tension wires because they'd have to go so slow, it would almost be stalling speed for them, then it wouldn't have worked and they'd mm -hmm. have to do something else. It's literally there is one threat in the world which can do this kind of attack consistently. And that is that aircraft, which is always accused of being World War I vintage, but is designed for three things very well. One, to attack ships in shallow harbour. Two, to fly a long way at night. And three, to be very easy to maintain. And that is what the swordfish is. It hits all three targets, and that's why it's in the whole way through the war. Because it can do this. It can do this very slow. Coming in attack. Belly flop torpedo thanks to tension wire. Yeah. But it, no matter how, it still couldn't get the Gilio Cesare. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we we'll get we'll that get later. To that, no. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, and then uh, this is an, another thing that uh, we should point out. So the the Royal mm -hmm. Navy was already practicing practicing and developing concepts and plans to kill enemy fleets in harbor or en enemy ships in harbor since mm -hmm. since the First World War, right? Yes, basically, it, that was there is an entire aircraft developed called the Sopwith Cuckoo which was mm -hmm. developed in World War I. And the whole point was Kriegsmarine, well, the Kaiserlich Marine at the time, hiding in Wilhelmshaven, uh, were not going to get away. They were going to take them out. And HMS Furious was slowly being turned into the carrier we would understand her to be by World War II, mm -hmm. literally to carry this aircraft to stop with Cuckoo. And that is what the Royal Navy is sort of developing. And then you have the various variations of Blackburn, Dart, Shark, and all sorts of aircraft, and the various fairy aircraft which come in into war period. But each one represents an evolutionary development on from the Sop with Cuckoo. And it's honestly one of the longest running development programs you can you can imagine because it's consistently in process from about 1915 to arguably the last example of it is the fairy swordfish and then they try and make a random jump to go to the albacore it does which was supposed to be an interim model it doesn't work and then they get to the barracuda which is a whole new type mm. of aircraft really but up until uh, sort of the swordfish they are just iterative developments of each other okay so it produces a very reliable very stable very rugged aircraft which they can operate worldwide and again that's part of the Royal Navy's requirement is always to be able to operate worldwide because all their infrastructure all their major support bases and their basically supply stuff is back in the UK but yeah. there Andrew Field's done an extra extraordinary amount of work on this so has Andrew Boyd on the Royal Navy's plans for war in the Far East and one of the things the Royal Navy had realized quite early on was they won't be getting any supplies. It will take forever for them to come through. So whatever they have there, they have to be able to maintain and keep operating and has to be as reusable as they're possible. So that's one of the reasons why they go for the armored carrier design, so that the carriers are more difficult to damage. 
so that they're hopefully they'll keep going for longer and will still be usable. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons why they go for the swordfish, because it's so easy to repair. But this also stands for other scenarios, for fighting in the Mediterranean, where they don't think they can get away from the threat of enemy air cover. Again, an armoured carrier makes sense. But also, again, repairable, easily fixable aircraft makes sense. Why? Because if you're fighting in the Mediterranean, the odds are you're going to be fighting the Italians who sit in the middle of the Mediterranean, which is the most annoying position to supply because you have a fleet which is based in Alexandria and a fleet which is a force which is based in Gibraltar. And that means if the Italians are sitting in the middle, you're not going to be able to run supplies easily yeah. through, are you? So you're going to have to send the supplies around Africa. So again, the Swordfish is an excellent aircraft for that because... And please excuse this language I'm going to use. It's not a profanity, but it is an actual quote. Swordfish were designed to be maintained with the wire from bras. Pretty much <laughs> the same wire that you would be putting in a 1930s brassiere could also be used for maintaining the wings on swordfish. And Brilliant. there are friends I have met who served in World War II who would tell you the wire would go both ways if necessity needed it. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. So, and and this brings us to the to the actual plan to attack Taranto. So, the this guy here in the in the picture is Admiral Lister, mm -hmm. who was the, the the mind behind Taranto. It, and I, I told this to 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 Alex in the pre-show. So, this guy, it, it's very not uh, well known, I would say. So maybe Cunningham gets uh, most of the credit for the attack, but he mm -hmm. was the guy behind the attack. He was the guy who. He actually uh, was uh, in Italy during the Great War. Uh, he he was able to see Taranto, Brindisi, all these bases used by the Regia Marine in the Great War. And uh, the the idea to attack Taranto and the Italian fleet at Taranto came up in 1938, if I remember correctly. When it, at... first iter it has iterations being developed on it from about 1933 onwards, when Mussolini starts to be really problematic. The British start to have a plan for neutralization of, of the Rager Marina, is what it's called. And there are various uh, variations on it. Most of the major attacks involve multiple carriers, but it's realized by 1938 that you would probably have to do a raid first, at least, and that would be a singular carrier. And so it's Lister at that point as the captain of HMS Glorious, who comes up with this plan for a single carrier operation, a raid. And that would be using Glorious and Glorious's air group, which actually would still have been bigger than the air group which was used on Taranto itself at the actual raid. Because, believe it or not, Glorious and Courageous could carry more aircraft than the illustrious good. Okay. Yeah, and... Uh... The, I would say also the the the, the plan is uh, yeah the, the, as we said the Royal Navy was always concerned about the idea of neutralizing the enemy fleets in harbor but the thing against the Regia Marina really comes up in 19, from 1938 because this is the moment where let's say the relationship between Italy and the UK starts to deteriorate the most because it's... yes there is the crisis of yeah. the Second Italian Abyssinian War. Yeah. But after 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 the end of the war, the relations are now very established. We have to remember at this point there is no uh, Axis Pact uh, Pact of there is not yet the Pact of Steel, which comes only in uh, in early 1939. Uh, so until 1938, uh, the Italy could still be saved in a way, but then yeah, after I... that. The, the deterioration in the international relations it's uh, more evident and Mussolini has decided to to follow this path and uh, although you... it will he will remain yeah. a bit schizophrenic about uh, his mood and his ideas on alliances and so on until 1940 and onwards I would say what you always have to remember with planning in terms of navies okay especially in the 1920s but even to this day a good navy will have a plan underfoot for any scenario they'll have a plan sitting there now the level of the effort put into that plan is going to reflect various scenarios um the royal navy and the u.s navy throughout 1920s and 30s maintained plans for war against each other and most people go there have been some historians who go this shows that there was an actual real threat of war 
But when you start reading the context and the diaries about it, you realize mm. very quickly the reason they have these plans is because the worst case scenario for both those navies would be a war against the other largest navy in the world. That's it. So if you don't have a plan for that scenario, as that would, you would be really, really remiss in your, jo in your job. Yeah. So br that's why, actually, when you look at the planning effort, the Britain's putting far more planning effort into war versus Japan. That's its number one threat. And as you and I have discussed on several points, the Royal Navy are regularly pointing guns at the Japanese who are pointing guns at them throughout the late 1930s. The, the Singtao incident in January 1939 is a classic example. The Royal Navy mm -hmm. cruiser is facing off with three it, Japanese cruisers in a harbour over a merchant vessel, which may or may not be British. And that is a classic example of what's going on. So that's why the Royal Navy has that as a really high plan. Basically, Italy was a traditionally sort of considered a bit a friend and actually had been a friend. But it's sort of 1933, things start to look iffy. So the Navy starts to maintain a plan. But that's a very loose plan. It's kind of uh, this is an idea of what we do if this scenario happens, but we hope it won't. It's the kind of plan which one or two officers come up together and put it together and then maintain about one day a month involved in it. But it's 1938, as, as you could say quite correctly, where they start to go, hang on, we need to actually have plans down at the force level of. What is the what can the carrier do? What will the battle fleet do? What will this force do, etc.? Of this existing fleet in that region, because Mussolini's starting to prove even less predictable than we thought he would. And also, at that point, it's when the politicians turn around and go, So, do you have a plan for Italy? And the Royal Navy <laughs> confidently turns around to the politicians and goes, Of course, we do. Write it quick. Of course, we do, sir. We uh, absolutely see. We have this plan which we've been working on for the last five years. This is our, glow, our geo strategic level planning. Uh, the more discrete unit plans, write them, write them quickly, um, will be, are, are, are not really uh, for your purview, sir. They're um, below your level and also secret. Quickly, write them. <laughs> As, you know, navies tend to do. Yeah, these things happen <laughs> in every nation, I think. <laughs> So uh, they happen every time. It's basically it doesn't matter whether it's the, the the armed forces, it's the civil service, it's the police, everything. They will go. Yes, here is our pre-prepared geostrategic higher level plan, which has all the nice concepts and ideas in. Please don't ask for the detailed work. The detailed work is it's being written, but you yeah. we're not going to tell you that because we're supposed to have it ready. Yeah, humans are humans everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, so this brings us to the to October 1940 because we remember we have to remember at the at the beginning the plan to strike the Regia Marina in Taranto was set to take place on the um, anniversary of the, the Battle of Trafalgar, so at the end of the 21st of October, Not right? That Cunningham or Lister were at all. Um... How do I put this? Historically motivated. Yes, <laughs> it was originally supposed to take place in October and originally was supposed to involve Illustrious and Eagle. Yeah. So and it then would have been e a far larger strike in that respect. Yeah. And then Eagle could not participate because they uh, it had some problems because it got damaged uh, some weeks before during a bombing. And, it got uh, delayed due to a fire on Illustrious, which damaged yeah. some aircraft. And uh, they had to be repaired, and quite a lot of them were repaired. And then, when it was going to be launched again, because on a moon, at that point, they found that Eagle was beyond uh, needed to actually be properly repaired. And again, yeah. this is the problem for the Royal Navy. They start World War II with the world's largest uh, fleet air arm, the world's mo the most carriers of any nation in the world in service, and they've already lost Glorious and Courageous, which were two of their their two of their largest carriers available before this this operation even takes place they're both lost well one is lost doing anti-submarine warfare of anti-submarine operations because the royal navy correctly worked out aircraft were very useful for anti-submarine hunting but all they had were fleet carriers to do it and really you don't want to go hunting submarines with a fleet carrier uh it's kind of a big target to go hunting that close to submarines yeah and the other one was lost when famously it was allowed to head back from Norway solo because again I'm presuming some admiral had 
a minor, I don't know, brain fart, for want of a better phrase, and decided actually the world is now safe and the Germans do not have large ships and our big capital assets can sail around on their own. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> I would like to have five minutes alone with that admiral and a piece of two by four, but we'll leave that to one side. Yeah, but no. So th this is all delayed things, and it's all meant mm -hmm. Eagle's been worked really hard, and the Italians managed to get close to her bombs, and she's an old ship, and they haven't yeah. sunk her, but they managed to shake her up real good, and this meant her fuel management system is broken, and <laughs> so she has to be repaired, and that's a that's a long job. Because if I remember correctly, the the Eagle was a uh, conversion. It was never yes. meant to... yeah. It was, was a conversion a of a battleship. Battleship, yeah. Yeah. She was a, going to be a Chilean battleship, the Almirante Lahore? No, no, I think I've got that wrong. Okay. I, I'm trying to remember what her original name is, Almirante something, but I've forgotten. It. Okay. Anyway, we get to October, November, and uh, as in plain Royal Navy style, they mount uh, a very complex operation aimed at uh, achieving several, several goals. Actually, there is one uh, es um, escort uh, of a com. The so the Royal Navy has to escort well, the, a convoy. There are technically to... three convoys, two yeah. airstrikes, and I'm not sure quite what we call the operation going into the uh, Tranto Straits, but it's something. Yeah, a convoy interdiction <laughs> action, and uh, we, there is also the uh, the Valiant and the Berwick transferring from Force H to Mediterranean Fleet, right? Yes. So there's a uh, there's also a transfer going on as well, yeah. a force transfer. Yeah, so, because yeah, Cunningham yeah. was requesting more and more units in the Mediterranean to fight off the the Regia, the Regia Marine. Because so that... again, uh, let's be honest: who are the big threat navally uh, at this point? Is it the Kriegsmarine with Shan Horse and Nizer now, and that's all they've got pretty much in the service? The point Bismarck will come into service, but it's a long way off at this precise moment. Yeah. Or the Italians, who have six battleships and actually all available and all operational. You know they've they've got a size of force which, frankly, the the Kriegsmarine dream of. You know, <laughs> yeah. the Kriegsmarine could mount a battle group like the Italians can put out the seas. The Kriegsmarine would have been ecstatic. The Royal Navy would have been going, "Oh my lord, lubber duck, we need more of his ships from, <laughs> right now." Um, but the, the you know the Kriegsmarine would have been ecstatic. So yes, the Rage of Marina is. The main navy, as far as the Royal Navy is concerned, at this point in 1940, they're the main opposition. The German submarine force is nowhere near the strength it's going to be and nowhere near the threat mm -hmm. it's going to become. And yet, but the Rager Marina's battle groups, bat their battleships, their heavy cruisers, their very, very lovely looking destroyers. Please note, I am avoiding discussing the light cruisers because there are two of those who are very good and there are others which are interesting <laughs> but they're heavy cruisers their destroyers their battleships the rebuilt ones and the brand new ones are all first rate excellent ships and that's something the royal navy's going we need to focus on yeah and at this point in time i mean for the whole 1940 the anti-shipping campaign uh, against the italian supply the italian convoys directed to libya has achieved nothing mostly because there are the forces of the, the the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy are kind of a stretch uh, everywhere. And uh, at this point, there is also still a lot of commitment of the RAF uh, to defend the home islands. Uh, and so the decreasing threat of the, yeah, the on paper invasion uh, of the home island will, will fade away. And in 1941, there will be more and more uh, aircraft becoming available. So that you, will also... You also have to remember there's a lot of forces on here which are very much forces on paper because it's you have the aircraft, you have the people there, but you don't have the supplies because, again, and this is something, the Navy, to an extent, functioned in. But one of the interesting problems you're going to have going along is that the supply of Merlin engines oh, yeah. to the forces operating in North Africa, to the or forces operating from the eastern mediterranean because those supplies have to go round africa and the navy had functioned it in 
for their naval supplies, which is why you have the huge naval supply dumps you do, and why the Royal Navy itself, in terms of its ships, tends to rarely have too many supply issues in the in the Eastern Mediterranean because they have the supplies stockpiled there, and they have others stockpiled in Ceylon, what's uh, one called Sri Lanka and India, and they have supplies even stockpiled in South Africa and in Australia they can call on. But the RAF and the Army, who had in many ways been dealing with being cut just as much as the Navy in the interwar period, and then in the RAF's case, focusing heavily on building those bomber forces, which they'd been really focused on because those were going to be their war-winning assets in the interwar period, hadn't built up those same infrastructure resource dumps. Yeah. And this causes a lot of problems because... You have to supply the army, the troops fighting on the ground in North Africa, and get the supplies around to them. And then, oh, you also need to get aircraft engines around and all sorts of things. So you have a lot of forces at this point in North Africa from the British and Commonwealth. And it is British and Commonwealth, very much British and Commonwealth. There's a lot of Australian ships involved. There's a lot of Allied ships involved out there, which are there. And the people are there, and they've got the equipment, but the equipment isn't serviceable because it hasn't got the parts. Yeah. So, uh, getting back to Operation MB8. So, we, we said that it's a very complex operation comprising several uh, movements uh, willing to achieve several goals. Mm -hmm. So, it starts on the 4th of November. Uh, I don't exactly remember when the Italians sighted uh, the, the first ships uh, um, with their um, rec uh, reconnaissance aircraft. But at, the, at, at first, they try to increase the reconnaissance at sea, and they, of course, send uh, torpedo bombers, uh, level bombers, uh, what they can master in the from the Regionautica forces based in Sicily and Sardinia to mm -hmm. attack the ships. But there is there are no, no significant... Uh, uh, achievements or hits in uh, during these attacks not even the submarines who were uh, a few submarines were sent in the sicilian channel in the uh, east towards the eastern mediterranean but the the problem let's say I put it short the the problems in the technological uh, technological issues of the italian submarines but also most important doctrine issues uh, prevented uh, any meaningful intercept interception because they were usually tasked to uh, stay in one specific point uh, stay there and wait uh, for somebody to come by and that was not the most uh, useful way to exploit submarines let's say no no the thing is the but we live and learn yeah we live and learn yeah now, actually for the italian forces the there is a, an interesting learning curve which i would say it's the 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 more exponential one is for the army the army learns quite a lot then there's the regia marina who at the beginning of the war is among the three armed forces is the let's say the the most prepared one but between many many commas let's say and uh, the regia aeronautica is the one who absolutely lacks everything it, it will yeah, learned something. The Ranger Aeronautic had, uh, I think there was one stat which I read and which I've always thought was probably completely wrong, but also kind of like as an illustration, was that they only had 24 hours flying time supply of, um, what's it called, uh, lubricant oil at the beginning of World War II for their yeah. main joint. Because there was a specific kind of lubricant um uh, lubricant they like to use on their propeller shafts and their main shafts to keep them turning. Yeah. And they only had 24 hours supply of it when the war began. I doubt that's true, but it does illustrate a lot of the issues for the Rager Aeronautica because they've been through a massive technological development period. And again, it's when you're developing all this technology, it's great. But it changes you. You're suddenly going from, well, I, I've got all this supply of this stuff, which no longer I need, and I haven't even got the supplies of that stuff, which I will need. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, then all the the military endeavors of the late 30s have consumed mm. all the stockpiles. They have stopped 
technological development uh, created any sorts of issues. So the, the regional attack is the least prepared of the three armed forces, and it's also the one who exits the war in the worst shape, I would say. Uh, She's a very yeah. pretty looking ship, isn't she? Yeah, she is a very good looking ship. Sorry, I've got I, I've got it on both <laughs> screens, so I can see the chat and I can see her, uh, see the, what you're going on. And she is, very pretty, she is a very pretty looking ship to yeah. me. I, I so, find it really annoying that we didn't preserve any of our aircraft carriers from World War Two. Again, this is another yeah. reason I would like to deal with the political class of Britain post World War Two most strongly. That none of these carriers were preserved because she would have been a beautiful thing to preserve and really should have been. Yeah, I think uh, this is something I believe uh, it's something that we can do and we can say today. But back then, uh, the mood was a bit different. the The priorities were others. So yes, the yeah, the, yeah. the priorities were to get move on and to develop and you know look forward to the future, but you're missing something when you abandon lessons from the mm. past and you abandon something which would have been a very emotive and beautiful lesson of the past mm. to have had because of all the things she had been involved. Let's be honest, this is a ship which is takes part in, of course, Taranto, does all the stuff she does in Mediterranean, does all the stuff she does in other in the Indian Ocean and in the Pacific, British Pacific Fleet. Mm -hmm. She does all sorts of operations throughout World War II. And she's the uh, one, the, uh, the after Ark Royal, she's the second modern carrier which the Royal Navy built. Pra and she's, you know, uh, without her, the Royal Navy would be in a very, very bad place. So, yeah, she deserved yeah. it. Yeah. So, uh, we mentioned the complex operations. So, the, the Italians are aware of the British presence at sea. Uh, actually, I would retrieve the, the map. So they are aware of the pres their presence at sea, and so they dispatch aircraft, uh, bombers, uh, submarines to attack the, the Mediterranean fleet. They keep the navy, so the battle fleet, based at Taranto in, in position to, to sail at sea and uh, fear intercept or engage the British. But again, the restrictive um, measures adopted by Supermarina limited at this point in time the let's say the the rules of engagement were very mm. much limited by supermarina and this is something that some admirals were starting to complain about and um, the main let's say the the guy responsible for it was cavagnari because he had he was in charge of the navy he ha he knew he, he was facing the um, most powerful navy in the world and he had no spare resources to throw in the fight. He had no at this point in time. He had no idea uh, of how long the war would have uh, lasted. Uh, we have to remember that uh, two weeks before, Mussolini had the brilliant idea to invade Greece, and so this meant that the Regia Marina was even more uh, overstretched because they had to supply the troops there and move the new troops that were required because of the faulty planning that Mussolini puts in motion. So, I mean, I don't want to defend Cavagnari, but he had some arguments, but at the same time, he was perhaps too much cautious in uh, uh, using his, his battlefield. They were also not served very well by the uh, maritime reconnaissance, they could have moved the fleet on the on the 11th of uh, November, and this could have, in theory, we'll never know, but it could have delayed or jeopardized uh, the British plan because if they would have uh, gone out at sea, they could have uh, come back to port too late. Uh, no, maybe, yeah, too late for the attack to take place. So, so we will never know. Uh, mm -hmm. One uh, among the, let's say, the the stuff written about uh, the Taranto raid by the Italian historian, this decision to not send the fleet out is also often uh, criticized because it could have uh, prevented the, the attack to take place. But another thing we have to remember is that uh, coupled with the 
operations, the land operations um, taking place in Greece, the, the Regia Marina had planned um, a bombardment of Suda Bay, which had turned mm. to be uh, with the invasion of Greece and the um, the the British coming in aid of the of the Greek of the Greeks. Suda Bay had turned into a wonderful uh, naval base for the Mediterranean fleet. So there was this plan to send uh, the battleships out and bombard Suda Bay to make it unusable. And this operation was uh, scheduled for the 12th of November. So I could, the, we could say that maybe the the decision to not send the fleet uh, at sea uh, on the 11th was also uh due to the fact that they were planning this operation for the day after and they didn't, they didn't want to incur in any problem or, I don't know, the, they didn't want to jeopardize this other operation. So, so I, think, I think it's not well known and could, uh, it's useful to bring it up. The but fact anyway. Is there are a lot of operations going on. I'm sort of, uh, it's yeah. one of those things when people, and this is another point you often have, to confront when you're dealing with military history and naval history and all these things and you must especially have to come from your side trying to explain to people that no one's dealing with just one thing at a time yeah uh, uh the classic example is pq17 whenever the british are talking about convoy pq17 almost everyone's focusing on that and going this must be what pound's constantly thinking about and actually what pound the first seal on time is probably thinking about is about two dozen different operations going on across the world and yeah. that's coming up at the point because it's a crisis, but he's then got to go on and start thinking about something else and think about something else and think about something else and think about something else. And that is the reality of war. You're constantly thinking about all, all these operations in parallel. And Cunningham understands this, and so do many other officers in the Italian Navy and the Royal Navy. And they understand that there is a point at which you can overload people. That's one of the reasons why this operation is structured as it is. With all these things going on at the same time, the idea is to give the Italians many senses of completion, i.e. if the Italians see that these convoys have successfully passed back, well, that was a good reason for the Royal Navy fleet to be out at sea, wasn't it? To cover those convoys, and now they're going back, so we don't have to worry. Or, you know, or, oh, they've taken, they've done a bombardment, or they've done a transition through Mal uh, past Malta, etc. There are all these different completion points that if you were an admiral watching and seeing what was going on and seeing what had happened previously and we're looking at your own things, you could think, okay, yeah, the British are now at home, it's fine. So we don't have to worry. Yeah. And that's the whole point. It's one of the, the things I often find annoying is people go, oh, they must have been so stupid not to see it's coming. You don't realize how complicated it was for the British to pull this off. It's not that the Italians are dumb. It's that the British pull off something which is akin to, how do I put this? Putting a man on the moon in terms of complexity <laughs> of yeah. all the moving parts. Because the moving parts you're dealing with, instead of being in one machine in terms of a rocket going up there, are people and individual people and parts of ships moving around and keeping all this. The, the force structure involved is colossal. I, you know, I have done a... A slide on that. There were two aircraft carriers involved. There's Illustrious, of course, we've mentioned, but there's also Ark Royal wandering around, which yeah. is always the focus point, because let's be honest, the Italians know the British have been looking at and thinking about how to hit fleets in harbour. There's been an uh, there's been a parliamentary committee about it. It was not exactly silent. It had very loud people on it who are making lots of grandiose statements to the press. And they did see Ark Royal come out. They know she's the Royal Navy strike carrier. So they presume any attack on harbour is going to be conducted by Ark Royal. It's an obvious, it's an obvious and very logical conclusion to follow. There are five battleships involved, including Ramily and Barham, Malaya, Valiant, and Warspite, which are four of the five Queen Elizabeth class. The only member of the Queen Elizabeth class battleships who's not there is Queen mm. Elizabeth herself. Tough. Her her slot is taken by Ramillies. So there are five of the 15-inch gun battleships the Royal Navy has there, three of which have been various states of upgraded. There's a monitor involved. Yes, HMS Terror is part of this massacre of Oka going on, you know, to use that Russian phrase. She is going from Malta, and she will go to Crete, and then she will disappear off elsewhere. 
there are two heavy cruisers, Berwick and York. There are between seven and eight light cruisers, depending on how you judge it. You put the maths together. There's Ajax, Coventry, Dispatch, possibly Calcutta, um, Glasgow, Gloucester, Orion, Sheffield, and Sydney. There are roughly 30 destroyers, including the Australian Scrap Iron Flotilla. This is a large number of ships involved in all this moving back and forth. And also including the merchant ships, all the torpedo boats running around, all the aircraft running around doing things. There is all sorts of things going on to provide the idea of a massive complicated operation but also mm -hmm. with many endpoints so that the italians if to they confuse see what's them going on it basically the italians are looking at it and going well it's quite obviously a large convoy and yeah. it's a very large convoy because the british are sending a battleship to join up with the mediterranean fleet and again this is where you come into the point of this mission one of the things that's often forgotten is that the battle fleet is not far behind the carrier force and one of the parts of the operation, this is why it's a raid, and we'll get into this, is the idea was the Italian fleet would come out in response to the attack and they would come into the waiting arms of those battleships, which have just been stirred up, which, by the way, Cunningham has brought all the Queen Elizabeths with him and he sends Ramillies back to Alexandria. So he's got the four faster battleships with him. And that's his idea. You know, again, the Royal Navy are thinking about night fighting. They want to try and get the Italians to fight them at night, which they know, which the Italians are not as well prepared for as no, the British at all. Have, because the British have been obsessive over it since World War One. And it's kind of like attacking fleets in harbour. It's become a mild obsession, borderline, uh, bordering on personality disorder for the Royal Navy. <laughs> they had several emo significant emotional events in World War I. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard about them. There was the fact that the German fleet didn't come out to fight as often yeah. as they were supposed to. That was a significant emotional event for the Royal Navy. Then they had the Battle of Jutland which didn't end the way it was supposed to because the Germans managed to sneak away at night. That was a very significant emotional event. They had the Germans. They were going to destroy them the next day and then they get away. This is just, this is not what you're supposed to do. Um, these are these are events which have scarred the Royal Navy's soul in a very visceral level. Mm -hmm. And as such, they are very good at attacking fleets in harbour and they are very, very good at fighting at night. Yes, they don't have the same doctrine as Japanese. Please, that's a fight which never takes place, really. So we'll never be quite sure how the two doctrines would play against each other. But the whole fleet operations, the Royal Navy's night fighting doctrine includes destroyer attacks, uh, cruiser attacks, closing in with battleships for gunfire at night, which is kind of weird because no one else seems to think that's a sensible thing to do at night, but the Royal Navy is very happily doing it and will demonstrate it in certain scenarios, which Gilio maintains are assassinations and other people try and claim are battles. I can see your, uh, Julia, I can see your phrase, Julia, on why it's, you think it's an assassination rather than a battle, but, you know. <laughs> it's, it's a massacre. Uh, <laughs> massacre. Uh, and, you know, also air power at night. You know, it, this is, again, this is the criteria for swordfish. Going back to it, it's got to be able to operate and fly at night. And it's one of the reasons why the swordfish is designed as it is, to be as simple and straightforward to fly as physically possible. So you can fly it at night without all the modern aids you have to help with night flying. Yeah, and then I I will just add that uh, yeah it's uh, very easy to think with hindsight uh, and uh, it's very complex to understand complexity in this uh, in this mm -hmm. when when looking at these operations and we also have to bear in mind yeah that multiple things were happening not everybody had all the informations plus the informations were coming in with delay with time lags. Uh, the recognizance was always uh, not up to the job. So there were a lot of issues. So the Italians at this point, uh, they they know that there is a complex operation, but they think it's uh, the classical British operation aimed at transferring ships from east to west, to west to east, and resupplying Malta. And uh, when they realized that, uh, from what they see, that uh, the 
the Mediterranean fleet is heading back to Alexandria. They are not any more concerned uh, about this. Well, let's be honest. The, uh, yeah. To their minds, the Mediterranean fleet has just completed a massive risky operation. They're not surprised yeah. they're heading home. This that would be a sensible thing mm -hmm. to do. That's what I. It's again. It goes back to the same craziness, which goes. Let's attach a tension wire to our aircraft. So yeah, the, exactly. So the, nicely, the explosive bit, which is going into the water and weighs a lot, is going to still be attached to the aircraft when it hits the water. Yeah. You know, that, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mindset. It's a, yeah. Then also, of course, there we have to, I would say we, we should also include that the fact that the Italians, since they never developed a functional aircraft carrier or a fleet air arm, they we're not in the position to understand the power of this uh, um, of aircraft carriers and uh, airborne uh, torpedo bombers. Also, it's it's important to know that there are people who who saw this coming. Uh, I found the 1938 Admiral Pal Palladini uh, evaluated this possibility of the um, a torpedo bomber attack against Taranto that could come only from uh, aircraft care because the airplanes in Malta didn't have the range to do so. Mm -hmm. There were not other bases available. So the only possibility was uh, with aircraft carriers. They, mm, they envisaged um, a sort of patrol, ski, um, pat patrol uh, by destroyers and auxiliary cruisers in the waters in the Union Sea. But this plan was never... Put in practice, they thought that the uh, all the aircraft, the anti-aircraft defenses of the base, the torpedo nets, the the balloons were sufficient to fend off this attack. What happens that uh, the... I'm going to be incredibly rude for a second because I'm going to disappear for a second because it's only me and the fluffy researchers. Ah, uh, yeah, the alone, fluffy researchers, and system. he needs to get out the door. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't need to worry. go open the door, so I'll be a second. But can, yeah, I can hear yeah. you, but I'm just going to disappear from the camera. Okay, go, go, don't worry. Sorry. So I will bring up some of the um, images of the aerial reconnaissance that were taken over, over Taranto. And here you see the, the two battleships at the front are Littorio and Vittorio Veneto, while the other two are... Duilio on the right uh, and uh, Cesare on the on the center, and these pictures were taken by the the British uh, air, uh, reconnaissance planes, where that flew quite a lot of um, flights in these days. And the last one took place, I think, in the between the 10th and the 11th of November, by a Malta-based bomber who then flew back to Malta, and then the, uh, the fitter arm sent uh, uh, a swordfish back to Malta to get the pictures of the, the, the latest picture of the uh, reconnaissance to, to see if all the battleships were still there, what were the positions of the nets, the balloons, and so on. And regarding the, um, the defenses of the base, Sure, there were around 100 uh, anti-aircraft guns, but we also have to consider that there, there were all the guns and machine guns mounted on the six battleships, the cruisers, and the destroyers available in the... Uh, pre sorry, present in the base. And uh, the torpedo nets were present. They were not placed in a way to... Oh, his, Alex is back. Sorry. Yeah, I was talking about the defenses of the of the base. I, I, again, apologies, but Don't I'm worry. the only one here to look after yeah. him. So. <laughs> we are three now. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's basically he he's got bad ear infections, so he got left behind with me today. Yeah. So I was saying about the torpedo nets. Actually, yeah. the uh, the base was meant to have. 12,000 uh, meters of torpedo nets placed around the anchorage of the anchorages of the battleships. The problem is by the time of the attack, only a third, around a third of the nets were put in place because of various delays, because uh, of uh, overlapping um, Well, people hear net it's, it's, and they think it's something very simple, but if you're stopping a two-ton torpedo moving at 
something like 40 knots, that's not going to be a net as in your nice piece of cloth or wire, etc., cool. which holds that catches a fish. This yeah. is a when we're talking about net, we're talking something which is chain linked, usually made from steel, sometimes iron, but those yeah. rust completely. And it's something which is designed to take the impact and slow down, preferably causing it to go at weird angles so the torpedo is completely caught. This is not something which is quick to produce. And again, this is Italy has infrastructure limitations. And, and again, can, uh, yes, and we, again, we can go back to the whole problem with the, uh, to an extent, the fascist government as a whole is they, kind of like some modern governments, they're very good at spending on the big flashy thing. They want to spend money on that, but the infrastructure stuff, they're not so good at. Yeah, true. And the also regarding the balloons, actually, there I read that there were uh, the balloons in place. Some others were not placed because there was not enough hydrogen to pump the balloons and to put them in the air. And then a bunch of other balloons were stripped off by the, a storm or a strong wind that uh, took place the, the days before. And yeah, so the there were, let's say, more ways uh, to approach the battleships at Anchorage. And I was, uh, I, I don't know if you heard that uh, when, when you were out. I, I, I just recalled that uh, yeah. the. I was the listening the whole time. Ah, on my head. I yeah, no, because I, 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 found, I found very fascinating the story of this last reconnaissance flight flown by Malta. They took mm -hmm. pictures of the harbor, like the, I think the day before. And mm -hmm. they uh, flew back to Malta. Then a swordfish flew to uh, from Illustrious flew to Malta to get these pictures and, and bring them on board to yeah. to, to make the last well, no, briefing. Uh, you you have to remember he was actually technically not allowed to take the pictures because he was allowed to look at them, but the RAF intelligence officer, the head in the inter department, not the guy who was actually dealing with him, said, "Oh no, you're not cleared to take them away from here. That's you're not. It's not considered a secure site by us aboard an aircraft carrier." <laughs> to which the Royal Navy were kind of confused. And so the very friendly officer who was put made responsible for this particular, the naval officer who arrived and went, um, would you like a coffee? Yes. Went off and got a coffee, tea. And while he was away, uh, very carefully, the pictures were all disappeared inside the jacket of the naval officer. So then he flew back to um, the ship with a whole fresh load of potatoes filling up the cockpit behind him, and where you'd normally have an observer, and all the photographs in his in inside his basically his button-up jacket. Wonderful. <laughs> and that's how the Royal Navy got the uh, got the actual photographs to plan the attack. Amazing. And so yeah, we we come to the attack. Uh, here's a, a map that I I drew. I've, I've, um, I drew yesterday about the, the attack. So we have the Mar Grande, which is the upper part uh, of the Taranto you base. You can maybe answer the question. Who was Gilo Cesare's godfather? Who loved it so much that he they made it the center of the fleet so it couldn't be hit no matter what you do? <laughs> what, you know, what that, that ship has more plot armor than almost, well, almost as much plot armor as, as um, Warspite, but more than New Zealand. You, there is no. I have conducted so many simulations and so many workovers of this attack, and at no point can I actually get something to line up and actually hit the Gilio Cesare. It's just yeah, impossible. Because so, who loved her so much? Because you you see from that disposition, the old uh, rebuilt uh, dreadnought are placed are anchored closer to the coastline, while the Litor and the Vittorio Veneto are more um, to the to the exterior, and the Ch the Julia Cesare and the Doria are, let's say, the more central. But as you, as you pointed out in your simulations, the Cesare never never gets hit. Maybe <laughs> maybe because it's 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 more surrounded by the other three. Yeah, I don't know. Well, that that could be an explanation. You just you you can't hit it with a torpedo bomber. There yeah. is no way <laughs> because you have you to can either. Try. either because you, you can keep going in for it, but you're not going to get it. I, I even had one simulation where, where 
literally Dulio is blasted in half because it's been hit by so many torpedoes. Because I basically designated it as the sole ta a ta a target for free carriers worth of torpedo bombers. Yeah. And they still can't fire a torpedo through the split in half Dulio to get to Cesare. Yeah. They can't to get to the Cesare. They cannot do they cannot hit it. Yeah, because either you have to fly over the city or fly over Duilio or fly in between Littorio and Duilio. So it's a very nasty job to, to carry you out. You can't do it. That, yeah. that ship is... Someone loved that ship more than anything else and basically went, you will not hit my ship. Yeah. So the, the attack uh, developed in this way. So there was a first wave coming um, above Cape Rondinella uh, in the northern part. And at the same time, there was a diversion attack uh, made by swordfish carrying bombs uh, over the Mar Piccolo against the cruises and destroyers there. The idea was to attract the searchlights over the Mar Piccolo and uh, divert the attention from the torpedo bombers because there was this uh, worry about searchlights that they could have blinded uh, the pilots and this would have jeopardized the attack. So some swordfish were equipped with bombs and they attacked the Mar Piccolo to divert the searchlights. And then at the same time... They were they also was... doing various things to try and... You have to remember, they're dropping flares and doing the bombs also yeah. to illuminate behind the ships. Yeah, the Bengala runs the here. That, uh, they're using it... The Royal Navy has some very simple methodologies for how to fight at night. I was telling you the other way about... And I think uh, I was discussing about how the destroyers... The plan to attack at night and to fight at night was to use things like the tribal class with their 4.7 inch guns to blast away at ships like heavy cruisers and battleships, which they would never damage. But the fire, their shells hitting would make fires on their decks. That was the plan and would start sort of illuminate them so that the torpedoes could be aimed at them. And it's the same by other destroyers. And it's the same with the aircraft attack. You have the idea of going, we're going to put illumination behind these mm. ships so they're nicely silhouetted so the attacking aircraft can yeah. see them clearly. Exactly. Yeah, so the orange it's are the Bengala basic, runs. basic, but brutally effective. Yeah, because they are silhouetted against the, the light so that you can mm. clearly see them. Do you know how long lasts the effect of a Bengala dropped in this way? It can be minutes. It's not out. It's not. Uh, it's. It can be ten or so minutes okay. if they're dropped it, it, because they're parachute flares and they are designed to descend very slowly. But it does depend on wind conditions. If you've got a high wind, mm -hmm. it will drop a lot quicker. If you have a very still calm night, mm -hmm. it will drop a lot slower. Slower. So okay, it's so... basically it's it's the case of the, the the calmer and better the weather, the longer you have the illumination. And those flare dropping aircraft are some of the best pilots, but mm. they're also fulfilling a, 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 a another role in that their observers are very carefully watching. Hello, the other fluffy mm. research assistant has appeared. So yeah, the other back. one. Um, the you know, their purpose is to circle around and spot what's going on and report back. So the British are getting up to date information about what's going on the whole uh, for, uh, for the strike. Now, they won't know whether their aircraft are returned or not. In fact, most of the flare aircraft actually presume when they get back, and there's this great line the one who's the lot turns out to be the last aircraft to return from the strike mm -hmm. lands, and as they're landing on Illustrious. They're basically the observer and the pilot are talk uh, have both convinced themselves they're the only aircraft that survived, and they only realize it's not the case when they are taken down in the lift because no one's told them. And as they go in the lift into the lit hangar, they see all these aircraft in front of them being arraigned and protect and re repaired, and they're going. They all survived because there was such a cacophony of AA fire, such a massive display, an awesome display of firepower going on, they mm -hmm. couldn't see how any of the aircraft had survived. And again, the swordfish advantage of being very slightly slower 
and being able to fly incredibly low had actually meant that quite a lot of them had got in underneath the level of AA fire. Yeah. So they'd had the full, when they descended, they'd had trouble. But the moment they got to low enough to where they were launching their torpedoes from, which was pretty much wave height, they were fine because they were below the elevation of the guns because there were two reasons for this. One, the Italians didn't want to fire on the town yeah, and kill a load of their own fellow Italians. And two, the gun mounts had not been designed with the idea that they might have to be firing that close in this sort of enclosed waters. They sure. could depress their elevation, but they weren't despite designed to depress their elevation enough to hit something which is yeah. measured distance of hundred of tens of meters rather than hundreds. Yeah, and I below, I, I think also that at first they uh, with the diversion attack they thought that there was a level bombing happening, so the, yeah. the guns were elevating up and not elevating down. So yeah, so I just showed the I just showed these maps that again Tucci and World of Worship provided me like uh, an hour ago. So thanks again to Tucci. And, it is a uh, very good example. Yeah, yeah. How the flares are dropped to illustrate the positions of the ships. Yeah, and yes. again, Cesare. Cesare, yeah. You, she, she's covered again. Doesn't matter where the, where you drop the flares, you can't illuminate her enough to attack her. Because she's got all these other ships around her and the town. True. That ship is just protected in that harbor. Yeah, no, I wanted to show this. Yeah. So uh, back to this one. Uh, so mm -hmm. the, the first wave, the first wave manages to hit the the Duilio and the um, the Litorio with two torpedoes. Actually, the uh, two torpedoes that hit the, the Litorio are. Um, the first and second uh, one we will see it after in the, in the damage report are not mm, do not compromise the uh, uh, how to say the the, the 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 ship the integrity of the ship. The problem will come with the third torpedo, which will strike in a dangerous area outside of the torpedo defense system. Well, it's always the thing. You don't just have to hit the ship. You have to hit the ship in a place which is vulnerable. Yeah. And if you and just hit the ship where it's got its torpedo defenses, it can often ride it out. And then we have to bear in mind that the shallow waters of the harbor had the effect that they uh, magnified the impact of the explosion. Because if you have more water below you, the explosion, the effect of the explosion, it's dispersed in the water. While if you have a, a limited sea, uh, a shallow water beha below you. The, you have less space to disperse the explosion, so the explosion is much stronger. And one of the things which is often misunderstood about the damage report is people, when they focus on a damage report and the recovery of the Italian fleet afterwards, and the Italian fleet does recover, is they focus on the holes made in the hull by the torpedoes. And actually, it's all the machinery which has been damaged by the vibrations of the explosions. It's kind of like what's happened to HMS Eagle. Mm -hmm. It's the yeah. bomb. It's the, the bomb never penetrated Eagle. The, the, it just blasted off near enough to shake the fuel system, and that's what they need to repair. Pretty much every single battleship in the Italian fleet has some level of shock damage. Now, some of it's minor, but some of those ships which are sunk, the reason they take longer to get back in the water and be repaired is not because of the damage done by the explosions in terms of the area which has been damaged is the shock damage mm. through the hull and fixing all the systems which have been yeah actually they by... the the report on the battle damage suffered by Leitorio it evidenced that there were failures in the damage control system and also in some of the uh, say um, tools um, compartments on the ships mm. And this was in part because the the Littorio was built in Genova and by the Ansaldo and the Vittorio Vento was built uh, in, in Trieste by the uh, another shipyard. And they found that uh, the work done on the Vittorio Veneto was of much higher quality than the one on the Littorio. But then this experience of Taranto, uh, let's say, brought up these issues that they were sold. And this proved very helpful at Matapan because the damage control system at Matapan was perfect on the Vittorio Veneto. It 
after it received the hit, it was able to uh, again develop 19 notes. Uh, shortly after it was hit, uh, and mm. thousand tons of water water have, had entered the the ship. So in this way, the Tarrant experience was helpful for the Regia Marina. And and yeah, we were seeing the first wave, and then the the third wave hits the the Litore with a third torpedo, and uh, the Kabul with uh, with another torpedo. Mm. And there are only two swordfish lost uh, in uh, in the act. one one is lost, uh, and uh, I'm sure it's lost during the second wave, uh, while hitting the, the the plane that hit the Kabul got hit. I mm-hmm. don't remember about the the other plane. Uh, oh. But... Oh, let me try and remember. One goes down. Hmm. Oh, they... yeah. Never mind. It's, goes... a... it's a. It's a case of. It's. I, I'm now remembering all the details of the one you've already mentioned, and I'm trying to remember the, 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 the details of the one which uh, the other one which went down. Uh, mm-hmm. One had to turn around right away. Mm-hmm. And that was the sort of uh, that aircraft had to turn around because it was the, it was it took off and basically immediately went. Hang on, we've got engine trouble and had to go back. Uh, one was lost, and the crew ended up. They launched their torpedo, hit the flew too low, hit the water, and ended up getting out and sitting on top of. Some uh, one of the Italian things in the harbor, and I basically found in the morning the, the Italians suddenly realized, Hang on, those two people sitting on it are that they're, they're Royal Navy Fleet Air, are they're, they're, they're British. <laughs> there are two British guys sitting there watching, have been watching the attack the whole time, and they're going, Yes, we're, we're British, we're not here to be, you know, hurt <laughs> by you. Uh, w- w- but, um but the aircraft, it was, um, I think it was Lieutenant Bailey's aircraft, which was shot down. And that was from the second wave. And that was shot down by, um, I think, the uh, the Gorizia. The Gorizia. Ah, yeah. The heavy, uh, it's heavy aircraft, and the aircraft fire managed to um, uh, be taken out. But, and that's the one which is, that was one is lost and the crew are lost. Um, but it's the first wave, it's the aircraft of Williamson and, and Scarlet who are taken pr- uh, prisoner. Okay. Um, sadly enough, the ba- uh, the two, the two part uh, the, t- the pilot observer of the aircraft hit Bailey and Slaughter are both killed. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. I remember one crew got killed and one crew got captured. Hmm. So here's the, the, the images taken, uh, by the, British Air Reconnaissance the day after. This one mm-hmm. in particular shows the, the Cavour that it's uh, sunk in the harbor and it's leaking naphtha in the in the water. This one is the Littorio, which is already surrounded by the auxiliary ships. And there is also a submarine. If you see it on the on the right of the picture, that there's a submarine near the ship. This mm-hmm. submarine, I don't remember the name of the submarine, but it was used to power the uh, the electric apparatus of the ship and uh, to facilitate the works because the ship was out of electric power yeah this uh and if you want something that can produce a lot of electricity the best thing you've got on navy at that point is submarines which because of charging batteries yeah yeah. it's useful yeah here's a picture of the mar piccolo where the the dama the there were the the cruiser Trieste and another destroyer, I don't remember, maybe it was the Libecho, were hit by bombs but lightly damaged. And uh, here you see the, the Trieste and the Trento up in the water and then a bunch of destroyers. And I think those two cruisers in the, the um, near the coast are the, uh, the Garibaldi and the Abruzzi. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I think this, uh, uh, this is, is before the, the attack. We'll get in a while at the uh, um, Otranto uh, Strait clash, but I, I, I wanted just to add that uh, what happened to the battleships? They the battleships didn't sunk immediately when they were hit. Obviously, yeah. what happened was that the Duilla was hit by a torpedo and the uh, Littorio was hit by three torpedoes. They were they started to uh, embark a lot of water, and they decided after the first. Uh, 
damage assessment, the, the respective captains and uh, uh, division admirals, they decided to uh, bring the ship closer to the coast and prevent them to sink in the uh, the areas of the harbor where the water, waters were deeper. So the uh, if we get back to the uh, to the map of the harbor. So basically, Littorio is uh, stranded in the north uh, west of the harbor. Uh, Duilio is uh, stranded nearby uh, as well. And those are the ships that are, let's say, easily put back in action. Well, the Cavour, uh, on the Cavour, there are some discussions going on between the, the captain of the ship and the admiral of the division to which the Cavour belonged, uh, which is Admiral Brivonesi and the cap. I don't remember the captain of the, of the Cavour back then. Uh, so there is an argument with it between the two. And what happens is they delay the order to, uh, to strand the ship. And so Kavur got uh, sunk uh, in, in the waters and it's the one that will be uh, put back in action. It will never be put back in action, but it will be refloated uh, uh, later in 1941. It will uh, never serve again in World War II. Uh, what I point out just quickly is you might be looking at this map and you're going, hang on, Littoria is hit by three torpedoes. How do they get to that third one, which is further along? And that's because an aircraft gets separated from its wave. And instead of doing what it's supposed to, the attack across Mar Grand, that is the aircraft which manages to do an attack from across the town. <laughs> and that is the one which goes into the town and go basically dives down in a hole of the AA and attacks from that direction. And again, by the way, I have tried to do that on the Gilio Cesare with that yeah. and, we, uh, and still failed because it's too close to the shore. <laughs> That I mean, you can't, you cannot sink that ship. Yeah, we will get get to that at the end. Um, yeah, and then we will get back also on the on the damages uh, on the battleship at the end. Uh, this thing, the uh, few hours after the the uh, the ride on Taranto, there's another operation going on, still part of the complex uh, British operation, which is an attack at the uh, supply routes between uh, Brindisi, Taranto, and the Albanian ports. So what happens is that uh, a force of light cruises and destroyers is detached. It's Force X, if I remember correctly. And they find a small Italian convoy consisting of four merchant ships, an old torpedo boat, and an auxiliary cruiser. As we know, the, the Italians are not in the position to fight at night. So what happens is, to put it shortly, the, the convoy is destroyed. The, the, here you see the, the kind of unfair fight between uh, some of the combatants involved. So the, you have the HMS Ajax and the torpedo, torpedo boat Fabrizio, who was uh, a World War I uh, to destroy it, who was downgraded to torpedo boat, which in its in in its defense, it's uh, it it tries to fire at the British with their uh, one hundred millimeter no, guns. Who are the uh, the forces on each side? You have the Niccolo Fabrizi, you have the Ram Free, the Ram, and you 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 have four merchant vessels, and on the other side, you have Rear Admiral Henry Pridham Whipple with HMS Sydney, HMS Ajax, and HMS Orion. Basically, two Leanders and a modified Leander cruiser. Oh, and just for extra measure, two destroyers, two tribal class destroyers, HMS Nubia, which will go on to become one of the most decorated ships in World War II, with one of the uh, with almost as many battle. Uh, well, if you judge battle honors the same for destroyers as you did for battleships, more than War Spite, but even as the way they are judged, almost as many as War Spite, and HMS Mohawk, her sister. I'm not sure if the Italians had a force which would be below their heavy cruisers, which I would want to risk against that force in a night action. Considering yeah. all those ships are trained heavily to fight at night, and considering which ships they are, none of them are the ones you want to fight at night. 
Yeah, and especially not a, a Great War era torpedo boat and an auxiliary cruiser. Oh. So yeah, what what happens is that uh, it's, uh, that that's the Ram three. The so the combo the convoy gets destroyed. The the Ram three disengages, uh, slightly damaged. Also, the Fabrizio at some point it's hit. It tries to uh, bait the, the Force X uh, towards the minefields near the Albanian coast, but then the Force X withdraws because they, they have achieved their mission. And actually, this is an important uh, clash to remember because it will have some uh, strategic consequences because it will uh, lead the Regia Marina to reinforce the escorts uh, around the supplies, the convoys, uh, taking place between uh, Albania and uh, and Italy, and this is a, a serious thing because the Regia Marina we, we already said that uh, was already overstretched. Its destroyers and torpedo boats were already overstretching uh, in the various escort missions, either for escorting the battle fleet or escorting the hundreds of convoys taking place. So this was. Uh, uh, an important blow to the Regia Marina because uh, between November and uh, April, May 1941, uh, which is the time when you know the, the Balkan front is in a way closed for the Axis because you have the Germans intervening and uh, Yugoslavia and Greece are defeated, so you have less need to uh, resupply the, these fronts. Uh, so that Alex, anything else uh, about uh, this clash you want to add? You, you have to remember, this is basically what the Royal Navy have been training for for the last 20 years when they do it. This is right up their street. A street. This is a night strike by their, by their cruisers, their back pocket cruiser destroyers, as I like to call them. Um, their purpose is literally to go in and take out those merchant ships. Mm -hmm. That is what they want to take out. Because, again, chasing down the Fabrizi would be sound lovely, but that isn't what they're after. Yeah, The Italians can produce a torpedo boat far easier than they can produce four merchant vessels. And once you've sunk those merchant vessels, you also want to back away because you don't want to be caught at night, caught in daytime by Italian aircraft this close to the Italian coast. And you've done your job because, again, you have to... It's to accept the fagisti, the, the mindset of the Italian government at the time. The Adriatic, if uh, they were making jokes about, uh, boasts about the, um, about the Mediterranean being Mare Nostrum, the Adriatic was their back garden. It was supposed to be completely secure. Yeah. And now this is the Royal Navy have come into the Adriatic. And that's the point. Actually, ra actually th those vessels, the Ram and the, the, the Fabrizi surviving and being able to tell the Italian Navy and tell High Command, oh, yeah, they attacked us from the Adriatic side of the Otranto Strait. They didn't. They weren't going into the strait when they attacked us. No, they were coming out of the Adriatic when they found us. Is It's an earthquake. So, the attack on Taranto is one thing. To the extent the Italians were expecting that and they were, they were sort of, they prepared for that. But hearing what this happened, what happened in a, uh, this battle of Taranto, that's far more of an earthquake. True. For the Italian Rage and Marina, especially their the Admiralty, their their high command to deal with, than anything else in many ways. Yeah, and it's often overlooked, and uh, it's it's very important to bring it up. Well, yes, so because you... it's not cool and sexy. It's cruisers and yeah. destroyers doing their job. It's not something cool which then people can go. Well, this is what's this is going to be a stepping stone to Pearl Harbor, which is the really yeah. big thing. And yeah. you go, well, a they're two very different operations. And B, actually, if you think about it, the whole thing, the attack into the Adriatic, into the Straits of Taranto, the attack on T uh, Taranto, are all supposed to be things which are to bait the Italian fleet into coming out and charging out and fighting the Royal Navy. In that regard, Taranto is actually, and this is where I get into trouble, a bit of a failure. 
because it achieves its job too well in terms of kill, it kill does too much damage for the Italians to consider coming straight out, but it doesn't do enough damage to stop the Italians ever coming out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the problem. It's yeah. it's sitting in that middle area where it does enough. It's lauded as a successful attack when it was supposed to be a raid, and that's lovely. Yeah, it's surely but a tactical. It, it, it's, not, it's it's supposed to be a get bring the Italian fleet out so we can defeat them in the deep water where they won't ever recover their ships. Yeah, tactically it's clearly a success, but on a strategic level it's more complicated. Yeah, it buys some time. It's but... a success on a strategic level, but it's not the success which they wanted, and not the success mm -hmm. which sometimes it's portrayed as. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Portrayed as in the, the latter it's one. Success, <laughs> it, it's a success in Cunningham's terms because it buys him time. It buys him a few months. And that's what he wanted. That's the the most he could hope from it. Because again, remember, even when they're doing this operation, they know they've got a they've especially with loss of when Eagle can't go along, they know they haven't got the carrier firepower they were wanted to have on the operation. And let's be honest, if they'd been able to do it, they would have liked to have Eagle, they'd have liked to have illustrious they'd have liked to have arc royal all team up for this and yeah. all launch a strike together and each of those waves would have come from one of those carriers and it might well have been the illustrious and eagle launched their aircraft as one wave and then arc royal's aircraft come in as the second wave and that would have been a tremendous amount of torpedo bombers coming in and whilst Cesare would have survived because Cesare survives no matter what you do, no matter what you chuck at it. Short of a nuclear bomb, you cannot get at that ship. I know I chucked the nuclear bomb at it in one simulation just to see if that would actually work. Um, finally sunk it. But you know, if you do chuck that level of aircraft at it, it then it becomes an attack and it very quickly does do a lot more damage. But this was a raid. And the whole point of the raid was it was supposed to bait the Italians. As, well, actually, no. And this is the point. It's not supposed to bait the Italian admirals because Cum uh, Cunningham realises they are fairly professional. It's supposed to, ba uh, to bait Il Duce into ordering the admirals to put to sea. That's what it's supposed to do. And I think the cleverest thing that they really do is no one actually wakes him up. Until and doesn't really tell him till he gets up in the morning, as I understand it. Because if he had been woken up, he might well have been stupid enough to order the fleet to sea. So I'm not sure which smart person decided not to wake him up, if that is the case. But whoever did uh, did was probably the person who should be lauded for saving the Italian fleet. Mm, I doubt that they would have uh, supported the argument of uh, going out at sea. Mm. Yeah, but, but it's very difficult uh, to argue against the dictator. Ah, uh, yeah, surely. <laughs> but uh, yeah, before going to the last part, so the aftermath and the battle damages, I uh, wanted to ask a couple of questions. So the we have uh, Space Peaks Hovel who asked if there were any uh, remarkable anti-aircraft defenses uh, based on the town, on the city itself. Uh, Yes, there were, uh, I think, around 100 uh, anti-aircraft posts. But the thing is, at this point in the world, the land-based anti-aircraft positions uh, are not equipped with top-level guns, let's say, because the uh, the remarkable 90 millimeter guns uh, produced by Italy were not available in consistent numbers. Uh, the few available were uh, the naval versions. The other were old uh, Great War or interwar versions, but nothing great. Mm -hmm. And then light, lighter machine guns, 37 millimeter, 20 millimeter. The, let's say the bulk of the defenses was uh, the, the amount of guns placed on the, on the battleships at Anko. Yeah, I see <laughs> Bob said, Alex, you're obsessed with the Julius Chaser. <laughs> Well, I am, but it just it, it, it will not die. No matter how yeah. what you do to it, it doesn't die. Yeah. Uh, this maybe you can answer this. Was uh, was there any consideration given by the Royal Navy to attack Taranto's uh, port installations? Was there any land damage? 
Well, they were actually hoping it to do, uh, but the trouble is the bombs they used weren't fused correctly. Okay. Uh, they were. This is again the whole infrastructure thing. We talk about the Italians, but the British were just as guilty of it. They had bombs which had new fuses. They were very practiced with the torpedoes, but the bomb fuses weren't done correctly, and so the bombs they dropped on the fuel depot mostly didn't go off. And they created some damage from their kinetic impact, but mostly they didn't do as much damage. But the British were targeting the fuel supplies because the British thought, well, the British knew from their own intelligence that the Italian, the Regia Marina was always going to be short of fuel and taking out their fuel was as good as sinking in the ships. Yeah. And that's actually what, interesting enough, up in Genoa, where Arc Royal's hitting, they do get the bombs fused correctly, and they do do some damage to airfields, to bombs, and basically um, really upset the Rager Aeronautica because they take out entire scouting forces, which which is, one again, one of the, uh, the things that's built in this. You have, as part of this whole program, an attack on the very things which are supposed to be looking for you. Yeah, on the, the bombardment of Genova, it's uh, an interesting case because uh, Admiral, Admiral Yakino had, uh, he went out at sea with all the available forces uh, aiming to intercept Force H. And he was on the right course. But then what happens is that the Regional Nautica reports that the, the Force H is, is sailing south, uh, uh, is sailing south on the, along the western coast of Corsica. Then they change course, and then they find out that uh, it's not Fort Sage; it's a uh, it's a French convoy. <laughs> so this this this, this error basically <laughs> prevented Yakino to intercept Fort Sage, which, was, which would uh, have been an interesting battle to see. Uh, I think that Fort Sage that time had renown with it. Renown. It was it, rena it was renowned. It wasn't. It didn't have. Hood or any of the bigger ones, it had renown. So no, it I been, don't think Hood was. No, there. It would be poor renown would have had to go toe to toe with something. Vittorio Veneto, of, Doria, and Cesare. Now you see there is uh, the, the, Cesare is the one I'm worried about in that group because she's <laughs> okay. The other two I'm not worried about. Renown versus you know she's taken on Sean Horse and Nisenau and scared off both of them simultaneously and let's be honest she's a very scary ship is renowned especially when she's upset you sink one of her destroyers she turns into a mother bear with very very serious anger issues um as the crews of shan horse and nizana would testify to but you know with cesare there that that's gonna worry me that's a level of plot armor yeah, your obsession with Cesare. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so battle damages. So I first uh, prepared this graphic, uh, but then and again... In, just a quick point. In response to Bob's question, it wasn't when it became the Russian Noriovsky. No, that's because they changed its name. And if you change a ship's name, you give it bad luck automatically. Yeah, in fact... You should it's... never change a ship's name. In fact, it had bad luck <laughs> since it sank... Mm. Uh, but it was sunk by a German magnetic mine who was sunk in the in the Black Sea and then mm. came up <laughs> and sunk yeah. the ship. Yeah. So uh, to do the battle to 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 represent the battle damage uh, on the battleship, I prefer this this one. But then again, Tucci and the World of Warships team came up with this way more amazing thing. <laughs> Which yes, depicts... but yours is accurate, whereas this one is technically the Roma, I seem to remember you telling me. Uh, yeah, the thing is uh, also the, um, the also the silhouette I used, uh, now that I see it better, it's it's the Roma. Because if you, you can distinguish the Roma uh. from the Littorio and the Vittorio Veneto by the clipper bow. So the, the bow, it's more, uh, how would you say, it's, it's less linear, it's more... Um, it's basically designed for higher speed, and yeah. also uh, usually we say designed uh, designed for more oceanic operations. Yeah. So basically, and... a clipper bow design it's, it's usually tells you that ship's designed to operate in the Atlantic and the big oceans of the world more than the Mediterranean. Yeah. And the then, Mediterranean yeah, you... is a nice smooth sea compared to the South Atlantic and the North Atlantic. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it, it's a lovely place to go and kayak. Mm -hmm. Kayaking the South, uh, the North Atlantic, and the South Atlantic yeah. is um, slightly more yeah. interesting. 
Yeah. So the as we said, hit number one and hit number two uh, were happened during the first wave. Uh, the hit number two was from the plane that Alex uh, talked about, the one who flew over the city and then came back. And uh, the 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 ship was not compromised by these two first hits because the uh, hit number one hit the the Pugliese system. Uh, Although it, it hit the Pugliese system in an area which was, uh, its radius uh, was um, smaller, and so the it worked less efficiently, let's say. But again, these two hits, hit number one and hit number two, were not uh, critical. The problem came with hit number three because uh, it compromised the, you say, the, the float, floatability of, of the ship. Yeah. Um, huh. yeah, let's go. Let's go with floatability. That floatability does. of the ship. And so basically, this... it compromises its watertight. You know, yeah. its its ability to stay watertight and mm. uh, stay able to um, maintain its. Uh, yeah. How do I put it? it, it its uh, density vis-a-vis -vis the water around it. Yeah, and in addition, it's even a uh, uh, it's a larger. Uh, hole in the in the ship so this one led the captain to to bring the ship closer to the to the coastline and uh, stranded it on near the over the muddy uh, seabed and then we have Cavour which received one hit and Duido that also received one hit the, the problem is the these ships were smaller and they had uh, less throat than the 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 Littorio class partnership. So what happened is that the, the, the torpedo passed below the ship and exploded uh, under the keel, causing a lot of damage in an area where you have no armor, you have no torpedo defense system. So these are heavier damages for these two ships. Luckily for Duilio, it was ordered in time to, uh, to run aground. But for the Cavour, it was not, as we mentioned, and the Cavour uh, sank in the sunk in the water and was uh, the last one to be refloated. So here's a picture of the of the Littorio. Here's the and of course that's what those the torpedoes again are designed are supposed to do. They're supposed to pass underneath the ship and go up underneath a go up underneath it. They're supposed to be keel breakers. That's yeah. the whole point of the duplex pistol. Uh, yeah, the magnetic pistols. torpedoes. So that the magnetic, so the torpedo goes off at the magnetic confluence at the underneath the ship, breaks its back because why do you do that to get around those torpedo defenses, which, as we discussed earlier, have managed to defeat two of the three hits mm -hmm. on the you know. No, actually, the, the, the it, 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 yeah, but, well, let's be honest, they've they pretty much defeated it. It that that's not much damage. It's the third hit which does the damage. Yeah, the third hit does the damage. The let's the thing that the second hit hits an area which is not protected, mm -hmm. but it's also in an area where you can counter uh, the the damage. The another thing to remember is that the the, the Italian torpedo nets ranged. Uh, um, uh, 10, uh, 10 meters below the sea, the sea level, and the British torpedoes were set to to run, I think, around ten point five or ten point six meters. So they were, even even though the the there were nets defending the battleships, the the torpedoes passed below the nets and could which is all them. the useful thing of intelligence. Yeah, and the British had had a lot of very active naval attaches. In Italy, who had gathered all sorts of information, and they had an idea of how they also, from the photographs and some of the reconnaissance earlier, had an idea how big those nets were, and mm -hmm. they set everything up very good because they also knew how deep the harbor was. Yeah, and it was setting it deep enough that it would run underneath the nets, but shallow enough it wouldn't hit the bottom. And that is a very, very finite judgment. And you have to be very careful. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Here's the Cavour that, as we said, was the uh, the badly hit one, with which will never recover. Let's say uh, the, this this these pictures are, are pretty famous. Although the uh, this one uh, depicts the Duilio, and I think it's the maybe there is another one, but uh, I didn't have it under in in, in my in my folder. This one of the few of the 
one of the few pictures available of the Duilio sunk in, uh, in the Taranto Harbour. And, there is uh, actually a plan at one point for them to go full Mez El Kabir, i.e. to come charging in with battleships after the airstrike and the battleships to then engage the harbour. But it's basically decided that the carrier, when it's only one carrier, doesn't have enough fighters mm -hmm. to buy the, ca buy the ships the time to get away from the Rage Aeronautica the next day. But that had okay. actually been part of the plan the British had considered. And again, you have to say the sort of the Italians were very lucky with what happened to Eagle. Because yeah, yeah. if you if you'd done that as well, you could have been dealing with a lot more damage. Especially considering how much the lit the hub was lit up after the tax in order to do damage control and try and recover those ships and save those ships all the lighting going on, if you'd had ships from the horizon firing at that point, there could have been a lot of damage done very quickly. Yeah, it would have been maybe enough uh, torpedo bombers to to place a hit on Vittorio Veneto, which would have been very problematic. So because the Regia Marina would have been without battleships or with only two um, battleships. Well, let's say the Cesare never gets hit. <laughs> no, no, the Cesare never gets hit. But let's but, be honest, if you've got the if you've got the battleships, the British battle line, if those four Queen Elizabeths yeah, did come in not worry about and, the Cesare. And then, start, and then start blasting away. In the nicest way, Cesare might still survive, but if none of the others do, then no. <laughs> I, I I love her dearly, but and I, I have great respect for her. But she would basically be the sole Italian battleship for World War II, and that would change things dramatically. But there again, knowing the fact that whatever happens in that attack, basically you have one battleship surviving, just proves just how much plot armor that ship had. <laughs> so uh, after after the attack, of course, Littorio gets the priority for mm -hmm. the first ship to be recovered, and here are some pictures about. After after the litter is refloated and you have these huge um, tanks used to uh, uh, used to refloat the ship, and here's the moment where it's towed back in the Marpico and it's put in draw in dockyard to to repair the holes. And this is actually uh, the, the, an interesting picture of the salvage operation uh, around Cavour, which lasted for most of 1941. The operation was much more complex and uh, similar to the operation put in uh, in uh, in action to refloat uh, the Costa Concordia. You know, <laughs> uh, I, I, I would say, yeah, uh, isn't it the is it the Dante Algeri which has the trouble in Model One? No, it isn't it's the uh, no, no the Dan the the trouble no, turrets. The, 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 yeah, the 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 battleship that the Italian had in Model One they had to recover. The Leonardo da Vinci. The da Vinci. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I got Dante and da Vinci confused. I do apologize. Um, the, the recovery of that, it's its almost on a scale of that, from my understanding of it. In that it's almost on a scale of this is a national effort to get this ship back, even though we know we'll never be able to actually get the ship back. Mm -mm. It's, the, it's the importance of it's got to be refloated for national pride, but yeah, no one's ever going to use it again. Yeah, because to be honest, the Littorio was the priority, of course. Then you had Duilio. Duilio was the, uh, together with Doria, was uh, they were the two um, dreadnoughts that were rebuilt between 1937 and 1940. So where they were more modern compared to the Cesare and Cavour because their their secondary armament mm. and AA armament was way superior to the Cavour. But still, they were still ranking below the uh, the Queen Elizabeth or the R-class uh, battleships because they were, originally, they were dreadnought. They were not super Seriously? dreadnought. Yeah. Although that's a bit nasty to say anything ranks below the R-class. You know, I I, I, I I am not the big... I, I, I find it a bit cruel. I, uh, the R-class, though, you have to admit, are better than some things. But it's one of the things if Again, if this had been a full attack and had been an actual proper attack with all the aircraft carriers, if the Royal Navy had been planning it that way and had executed it that way, there is a reality that you do end up with a Mediterranean scenario, a World War One Mediterranean scenario, where in terms mm -hmm. of capital ships to balance out the Italian force available, you only need the R class. 
and that's mm. if they do go, they do a full strike rather than a single carrier. We're here. Yeah, these ships. Yeah, these ships had the advantage of speed, but then the their protection and armament was uh, not uh, a sufficient deterrent for the uh, even for the R class. It's it's the great thing of having the speed means you can decide when the attack's going to be. But the trouble is, if you're running along and you have to go and attack that convoy, mm. the, the R-Class isn't going to chase you. It's just going to stay with the convoy. And the moment you come within range is when you're going to get hammered. Yeah, exactly. So, and this last... Uh, I think it's the last... Uh, no, no, remember, so this is the Cavour, because the Cavour uh, was refloated, was towed to Trieste, where it was meant to undergo a second modernization in which it would have received a stronger AA armament, but then due to overall lack of resources, uh, especially lack of manpower, of skilled manpower, the ship basically remained there. It got repainted. Uh, the main armament was, at some point, was put back on the on the ship, but uh, uh, the modernization, the second modernization, never materialized because at some point they realized these ships were unusable they were just consuming precious fuel and they were not uh valuable anymore and ah yeah we got to the to the bonus uh, oh, yeah this is the bonus before. so so this is a com this is of a combined air group attack on paper this is the uh, this is a simulation i've done using the good old fashioned dice and the rules of, of very, uh, various rules of uh, rules of war gaming and also have done using some limited computer simulations to test out and basically the idea is what happens if illustrious neagle both show up so the attack group becomes 36 swordfish and nine full mars and each strike is sort of uh, probably three waves of eight torpedo armed swordfish, four swordfish, and three fulmers armed with flares and bombs. The reason for that continued division is because you're going to, uh, the Royal Navy is still going to want to try and, try and hit the destroyers and the cruisers with bombs, but also those, oil, those fuel facilities. But most importantly, they're going to want to distract from the torpedo bombers coming in, because remember, those mm -hmm. torpedo bombers have to go low and slow. And so you start out and work out, okay, what's the strike going to be? Well, this comes into 24 torpedo attacks. And again, it's presuming on all the aircraft working. So it's basically, to my mind, it's what would have happened if they'd managed to pull it off on Trafalgar night. This is probably what they could have achieved. Mm -hmm. Conte de Cavour, on average, gets hit by two out of two. The Andridoria gets hit by one out of four. Again, it's a difficult to hit. Uh, the Dulio hits two out of two. Littorio gets hit by six out of nine attacks. Wow. For some reason, the Littorio is just this massive soak. Uh, Vittorio Veneto gets hit by one out of four. And the Gilio Cesare gets hit by zero out of three. Okay. And you compare that to the reality was 21 swordfish, 50, and none of the because they didn't have that, and uh, they didn't have enough full Mars and sea gladiators. They didn't weren't prepared to risk any of the full Mars in the night strike or helping with the flares, which is mm -hmm. what they could have done. So you then go through the reality, and the results are 10 attacks. Conte de Cavour hit by one of one attack. Andrew Doria hit by zero of two. Dulio hit by one of one. Vittorio hit by three of four. Vittorio Veneto hit by zero of two. Gilead Cesare, no hits because no attempts because of where she's positioned. Yeah. And so that, that's the on paper versus the reality, you know. As a phrase which I repeat so often, people are probably bored of hearing me saying it. You go to war with what you have, you fight battles with what's available. You don't go to a war with what you want, and you don't fight battles with what you wish. And that's the real... This is what the Royal Navy theoretically has on paper, and what they could have launched if it had gone ahead on the 21st of October on Trafalgar night. But that's not what they have. So the reality is what's over further away from me.
Yeah, I read on the you know, the we we talked about this the the paper from um, Caravaggio, the, the Canadian uh, guy who wrote this paper on uh, on Taranto. He claimed that it's yeah, it's a tactical success, but uh, failed. Uh, uh, no, it's a missed strategic success. And then in in his argument, he points out that uh, the swordfish diverted to carrying bombs could be used uh, as torpedo bombers, while the, um, the Wellingtons based in Malta could be used to run the diversion attacks. And he claims that, uh, if I remember correctly, that this was possible because the day after Taranto, they, the, this Wellingtons attack Taranto, they do some damage. Like, but But that's a level of coordination beyond which no one has achieved at this point. You're talking mm. land aircraft and sea aircraft coordinating. And by the way, that's a level of communication necessary. Mm. They okay. either are relying on a prearranged information about when their time to turn up and guaranteeing navigation everything works out at the right time. Or alternatively, there is a lot of radio comms going backwards and forwards, neither of which they could do. And it's a okay, nice idea on paper. It's one of those things which, if you could have done it, and if it had, it's an on paper. It's an on paper attack. It's a really good one. It's like the on paper attack with the extra carrier. It's on paper. It's a really good idea. The reality of actually implementing it could well have given away the whole game if it had actually been able to be pulled off. And that's the problem you end up with. It's a case of, I'd like to do that. But what can I actually do? And the thing is about Toronto, the reality of it, as I've said before, mm -hmm. it achieves the limited aims it's set out to do. But the trouble is, is when you start comparing it to Pearl Harbor, you realize that they are two very different strikes. If the British had been planning Toronto on the, uh, to do uh, to do what it basically the attack Japanese are planning at Pearl Harbor, then in the nicest way, the British would never have used Ark Royal as the distraction carrier. She would have been the strike carrier because that's her job and that's what she's built for. But they decided that wasn't... Let's put it this way. They decided that the harbour was deep enough to attack them with aircraft, but shallow enough that sinking the ships in that harbour would probably not get them the win. So what they wanted really to do was to bait the, uh, the Italians into coming out to fight them. And that's why the Royal Navy fleet doesn't go home the next day. They hang around that day. They're also, there's also plans being put forward by the government, etc., back home that they should launch a second attack the following night with, mm. uh, you know, with the aircraft that survived. And Lister and Cunningham pretty much shoot that idea down. Because the they, fleet, they thought, a, a, yeah. why they, they shoot the idea down? Because they thought the Italians would be all awake and, know to re and actually be alert. And the whole reason Taranto had worked in the first place, the strike mm -hmm. had worked as well as it had, was because the Italians hadn't realised they were there. Mm -hmm. If the Italians are going to be on alert now, they're going to think someone's coming. So, so, they like, can actually uh, be prepared. Like a you similar know. explanation for the, the Japanese not sending the third wave on Pearl Harbor, right? Yes, but also then as the reality is that what were the Japanese planning to achieve versus the Royal Navy? The Royal Navy was hoping the Italians would come out. By that point, the Royal Navy realized the Italians weren't going to come out because they'd done too much damage for them to risk for the Italians to actually come out. That was the point. If it had done less damage, the Italians might well have come out to come and try and hunt down the carrier group, in which case they'd have run into the battleships. If it had done more damage, it would have bought longer. But the trouble is it's in the middle area where it's just enough damage the Italians aren't going to come out because they don't feel strong enough, but not so much damage the Italians are permanently knocked out the wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then I don't see the... I don't really see the... I mean, the, the British should have known that the Italians were not uh, keen on the idea on engaging a battle with unfavorable terms because they... They could not the British, risk the... Yeah, the British did underestimate, did estimate that. They did understand that. But they're banking, in the nicest way, they're banking on Il Duce being an idiot. <laughs> okay, that, that that's Cunningham's... Ba Gunning is not banking on the admirals being idiots. He's banking on Il Duce. He's banking on Artranto Straits having upset him. And he's banking on 
it depends on how much damage the Toronto Ray does. His worst case estimate, i.e. for the minimal amount of damage, is it basically does no damage at all to the attack of Rage of Marina, and they come out mm -hmm. on, on mass happily, fully strong. Well, in which yeah. case, in my way, if you put that scenario, if you'd said that the Italian fleet had not been damaged and the Tranto Strait happened, they might well come out to try and hunt down that cruiser force. They might well have come out, and then they'd run into the full battle fleet, or rather been ordered out by a Luce. But mm -hmm. the thing is, if the strike had done more damage, then the Italian fleet would not be his problem for at least another 12, 18 months. In which case, they could do have merry times, and Crete and North Africa would probably have been dealt with very differently and very quickly. Because if you have no Italian fleet able to operate for 18 months in terms of their battleships, then the outcome of the next 18 months get very, mm -hmm. very different. Yeah. And so, yeah, here we are in the in the the part where we discussed this. So the, we acknowledge that uh, on a tactical level it was a success. On the strategic level, we can debate to which degree it was successful because, uh, yeah, it was meant to buy time for the bridge and also to rebalance the, 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 the equilibrium of naval forces available there. But then... What is often missed in the in the, say, let's say the popular discussion, the general discussion, is you have this myth running running around that after Toronto, the, the Italian fleet uh, spent the war hiding in port. The thing is, one week after, uh, you have the Operation White, which is uh, one of these operations aimed at resupplying Malta with fighter aircraft. The, uh, the Regia Marina uh, sends the Vittorio Veneto and the Cesare at sea. They do not encounter the British, but their, their presence at sea alerts Somerville, and Somerville decides to um, order the, the Hurricanes to take off in advance. And what happens is that of, uh, of the 12 Hurricanes meant to uh, reinforce Malta, only three or four arrive. So this is this is a thing. Then yeah. you have also... Because uh, in, uh, it was in the ni nicest way, again, Renown on her own might be able to take on Cesare. This is, again, the, the, sort of the result you're dealing with. If Cesare had been the sole survivor, or the sole one not impacted or not damaged, then Renown probably would have gone, I can you could run the risk of Renown taking on Cesare. Because she is has been modernized. Yes, she's a battle cruiser, but she's got 15-inch guns. She's been fully modernized. She's got radar. She can do some damage. Yeah. And just and there's also there is an aircraft carrier backing her up with the aircraft. So that, but two capital ships, one of which is very modern and capable. Ooh, that's a, that's a different scenario. That's um um we prefer not to be. You know, risking mm. that if we could, because these are valuable assets. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, uh, on a on the level of the supply convoys to Libya, to Libya, nothing changes. So the the traffic remains basically untouched. What will change the situation? So uh, the anti shipping campaign of the RAF and of the Royal Navy will increase from a April 1941, but due to the increased numbers of submarines, aircraft based in Malta, in Egypt, and so on. Uh, and also the, the first uh, surface forces based uh, in Malta. Mm, then the, the Italian fleet will venture out at sea uh, after after Taranto. So the yeah, you have achieved a new equilibrium, but then you have the Littorio coming back in service in May. The uh, between April and May, if I remember correctly, the Duilio gets back also around May, May June 1941. The let's say the result, the long long lasting result, is the knocking out permanently of Julio of uh, Conte di Cavour, which somebody could argue it was uh, 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 not having Conte di Cavour could have been a uh, uh, saving. Precious NAFTA, which is could be yeah. an argument. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, could be an argument. But still, the Italians spent a lot of resources and skilled labor forces to labor force to refloat it and put it back in a service, although it was never completed. So a waste of resources in the end. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we and then 
you have the thing is the Taranto doesn't prevent the uh, the safe arrival of the Africa Corps and of the Ariete Division in uh, in Libya in between January and February. So we can we can debate short, certainly as Alex said uh, rightly. Taranto was not successful in the way uh, as the propaganda put it or presented to the world. Uh, but yeah, it was... Uh, one thing I, I always uh, want to underline is that during the clash of Partivento, uh, which is labeled as an inconclusive engagement between the Italians and the British, and they, the, the Italians uh, are being criticized for being too cautious, uh, Campioni was at sea with the Vittorio Veneto and the Cesare. He had received very strict and at the same time vague uh, indications from the Admiralty, from it's Super Marina. Good when the, yeah. uh, the lovely dictators of um, the Axis give their commanders vague restrictive instructions, which mean that they don't actually press any advantage. It's kind of useful yeah. to the Allies quite considerably. Yeah, then he was not served well by their reconnaissance. Then his cruisers scouting in front of the of the battleships uh, get in contact with the British cruisers. They exchange uh, fire. But then the, the battleships are attacked by the torpedo bombers. So they are aware that this an, there is an aircraft carrier in the area. So mm -hmm. I would argue that uh, the presence of the presence of the aircraft aircraft carrier there maybe caused Campioni some concerns because two weeks before there was Taranto and he was in charge of the only two operational battleships. So he may have considered that uh, he had to pull And let's off. be honest, while he can outpace most of the British battle line, uh, and especially all the battle line that's there, he can't outpace the aircraft. Even the swordfish can outpace his battleships. Yeah. Just so, it's it's a struggle, especially it, but with a tailwind, they can just about do it. Yeah. So I would say this was perhaps maybe in my opinion one of the uh, consequences of Taranto that we, that materialized like two weeks after. Uh, but it's 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 my speculation. I think that played something in Campione's I, mind. I think it, Taranto leaves a legacy of what the aircraft carrier can do in the yeah, Italian Navy's mind. That's for sure. And that's the the uh, honestly, I'd say that Taranto, um, certainly in the lessons of Crete, etc., shifts the focus of the air power to trying to take out the carriers rather than the capital ships. I would mm. certainly say with Crete, and when when you look at some of the actions that happen in Crete and some of the air attacks. They are increasingly, prior to Taranto, the capital ship had been really the focus for most of the air, air attacks. Yes, they'd gone after right. some of the aircraft, carrier, the aircraft carriers when they had the opportunity, but they'd usually, they, if they had a chip pick between a, a capital ship or an aircraft carrier, they went for the capital ship. After Taranto, yeah. they are more and more focusing on the carrier. Yeah, like the illustrious Blitz, which was a joint yeah. uh, Luftwaffe and uh, Regia Aeronautica attack with well, basically, after, after the last Taranto, illustrious has a great big target banner <laughs> overhead yeah. going kill me. you've got to, you're gonna come kill me and that's one of the reasons why her full mile pilots could become aces so early on and get the uh, get the sort of the um the rack up the uh totals of air to air kills they do is because so many so many people are coming straight for them it's very easy to become a very good a very recognized uh, air to air you know dogfighter as a pilot if your opponents are always going to be coming straight for your base it's also slightly paranoia inducing because they're always coming straight for you but it does mean that you are always know well they're coming for me so i can go back and fill up but they're coming to me yeah, and to be honest, I I love the full Mars. I really like them as I, uh, I know. aircraft. It's they're amazing. I, I, I do too. It, it's funny. I, there is you and there is Jamie Seidel of Armored Carriers, and both you mm -hmm. love the full Mars. And <laughs> I, I like them too. I do sit there and sometimes imagine what the world would have been like if um, the Royal Navy, the Royal Navy's requested, uh, well, the original version of the Sea Fire which was to be this sort of gull-winged, spitfire-like aircraft 
which the which supermarine were constructing and which is sort of stopped by the air ministry who are demanding focus on the on the spitfire and you have to imagine if that fighter had entered service and the Royal Navy had had that, then things could have been very, very interesting in some of those scenarios because that would have been absolutely glorious. Uh, but no, the Fulmar does its best to fill in and does a really yeah. good job. And it's one of the first, it's the aircraft which develops a lot of the radar operated and radar con fighter directed and fighter controlled. Uh, methodologies and ideas which will later be used in the Pacific campaign by the Americans mm -hmm. and the British uh, because they they all learn from the experience of the Mediterranean and that that's something which is important to learn. The, the Mediterranean is where a lot of these ideas get developed. Hmm. Yeah, and yeah, just that you mentioned it, uh, the relation between Taranto and Pearl Harbor because uh, I can tell you that I, I had the it's picture... It's overblown but... many times over. Yeah, the, the thing is, I, I had the pictures, but I forgot to bring them up. Uh, there was a, a Japanese delegation uh, mm -hmm. coming in Italy, and they visited Taranto. And by that time, the Admiral Yakino was in charge of the battlefield. And in his memoirs, Yakino writes that uh, the Japanese were eager to acquire information on the, on the Taranto yeah. raid, on the battle damages. But if I remember correctly, by the time of Taranto, there is already uh, the planning Japanese going on. The Japanese already had a plan. Basically, they saw this yeah. as validation of their plan. What they didn't see, again, were those crucial wires. Um, <laughs> using a USB to C cable as my wire, they didn't see that. They were just another cable sitting in the water. No one saw those wires. No yeah. one saw it's those the, tension cables. Instead, and that's they why, used... yeah, yeah. No, no, they used the the wooden things at the end. Yeah, of the they'd already years. been developing those, and they saw the British had been using those, and they saw, well, it might, must work. The British must have worked. And they didn't realize the British, that was one part of a two, you know, a two-part process. Uh, hmm. And they're already developing this. And also, you have to remember, the Japanese are sitting there going, well, you know, perhaps the British loaded up. This is one of the things. The Italians aren't quite sure how many bombers were involved in the strike. Yeah. They know a certain number of hits were achieved, but they don't know quite how many bombers were involved. Because you, you can't be really it's sure whether a torpedo is on a yeah. muddy floor. So for them, it could have been that Illustrious had managed to carry, had carried only torpedo bombers and had managed to use deck parking and everything and come along with 48 swordfish. And these hits have been scored from 48. They don't realize these hits are scored from basically 10, air, 10 attacks, 10 aircraft. Hmm. Uh, you know, they don't realize that's the hit ratio they're dealing with. So there is that going on. And the Japanese are looking at it and thinking, well, you know, the British must have used similar design to us. And the, the hit ratio and, oh, one in three or one in four torpedoes actually struck and managed to hit their target. So you know, working out and going, oh, yeah, Pearl Harbor will work. And it's actually, when you look at it, it's a far higher proportion. The British are, as I've said before, incredibly lucky, but it is a far higher proportion in terms of the strikes that hit than at Pearl Harbor or any of and sort of that scenario, simply because of the sort of the whole system, the tension wire and the other things taken up. It's when you go through it and you think that Littorio is hit by three out of four torpedoes that are fired at it, uh, Conte de Cavour is hit by one, and Dulio is hit by one, that's five torpedoes hit targets out of ten fired. That's a 50% hit ratio. That's frankly just... amazing. Yeah, it is amazing, 50%. You know, when you put it like that, it's 50% is amazing. And it's one of the things once you go up to, you scale up to 24 attacks, you find, again, if you're putting in the same sort of process, you end up with roughly, again, a 50% hit ratio. And you put those hits around. Well, 12 torpedoes hitting their targets versus five do a huge amount more damage. And I'm sorry, Littorio getting hit by six torpedoes does not survive. No, yeah, six no, torpedoes no, no. are too much. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, six torpedoes hitting anything is just, it's not going to, no. But that is uh, the fact is Andrea Doria is actually surprisingly difficult to hit. The fact that she gets hit, she, there are two attacks made on her, she doesn't get hit. 
and it's only a one in four chance, really, of you getting a hit on her because of the seabed, because of her positioning. And, you know, it's Conte de Cavour is actually surprisingly easy to hit. Dulio is surprisingly yeah. easy to hit. Littorio, Littorio is... It gets hit by three out of four, but once I do slightly more, I've got more aircraft, and da -da -da, the average comes down to six out of nine, which is roughly a two-thirds. It's not a 75% chance of hitting, a two-thirds chance of hitting. And you go through, where are those ships? Those ships are the ones which are literally at the end. Mm. And they're the ones which are least protected. Vittorio Veneto, it's a one in four chance of hitting her. It's the same as the Doria. They both have a one in four chance. And then there's Cesare, which you basically can't hit. Yeah. Oh. This was the theme of the night. <laughs> the unsinkable the the night. Cesare. <laughs> basically, as long as she sort of called the Cesare, she's fine. If you change her name, no. No, no, no. Coupled with poor Soviet uh, maintenance works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. So I think we have covered everything. Uh, yeah, we've covered uh, the operation, the attack, the prelude, the aftermath quite uh, in depth. I hope the, the, the courageous guys that followed us until now have enjoyed the night and how long uh, were we supposed to be originally because i did have a mental idea of how long we'd go on for so i wanted to see how long did you think this was going to be yeah i thought two hours were easily achievable um, but we could have stayed here for even three hours yeah but i think yeah, yeah but i think yeah. two yeah. hours and 21 it's uh i was thinking good... gonna be roughly two and a half hours yeah yeah, yeah fair enough. Enough. i thought if we were very disciplined yeah, but there are many yeah. others we can talk about and we can have fun to, uh, discussing. Yeah, our way, our way was uh, full of rabbit holes that we didn't <laughs> fell into. <laughs> we managed to avoid them quite well. I think you're yeah. skill, you were skilled in avoiding that. <laughs> Thank you. So, Alex, thanks a lot. Uh, Thank you for having me. I hope you will be back. Uh, we, mm -hmm. This was the first and not the last time where I want to develop this uh, exchange with... Uh, British and maybe also American and German historians in the future, and yeah, fun. we keep we keep the channel them. open. And uh, thanks again, and guys, uh, thanks for watching us, and see you next time. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.